This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Good morning. Here's a funny one. Right. Just just looking at the news. By the way, it's Thursday. I I must keep reminding myself of that because it feels a little bit like Friday for those of us who are going to finish work. Uh, for a long weekend today, not to make light, of course, of the religious festival that Christians will be celebrating. And in the next hour of the programme, I think we will take one of our uh, probably probably incorrectly rare strolls into religious territory, not least because this week's full disclosure features an interview with the Archbishop of Canterbury, which um, I think might have affected me more than, than many of the, or almost all of the interviews I've ever done before. I shall tell you... I shall tell you later. On a, lo- on, a, on, a, on a rather lighter note, wh- why do you think Morrison's is in trouble at the moment? Um, because it has a hot cross bun flavoured what? What have, they, what have they infused with the flavour of hot cross buns and so inflamed, supposedly, some Christian sensibilities? Although this usually means ringing up a one-man band who's desperate to get their name in the paper and have set up an organisation called something like Christian christian reality or something like that and you get you're working on the daily telegraph and you find a hot, a hot cross bun infused i don't know a carrot or or a hot cross bun infused in this case it's cheese they the morrison's are selling a hot cross bun flavored cheese and they've managed to find someone to complain about this and claim that it's undermining the sanctity and the uh, profundity of the Easter festival, so that that might come up in the second hour. Mystery hour at twelve, all being well, you know, God willing, if you pardon the segue from a religion. Anyway, got mystery hour at twelve, and for your delectation on today's program, I kid you not, two of the funniest political announcements I think we've had in a very very long time. One is not really political because the person concerned isn't really a politician, but uh, technically they could be described as such. And the announcement is is frankly hilarious. The other one is a fully paid up member of parliament and they have managed to get themselves into a frankly almighty pickle. In fact, I'll give you a clue if you follow me on social media or indeed if you follow uh, political matters with a with a with a desire to find something funny on social media. One of them has managed to get themselves into an almighty pickled egg, no less. Uh, for reasons that we may explore a little further later in the program. But let us begin. Let us begin, actually, by um, sympathising with Angela Rayner, who's managed to turn up at a Labour Party uh, event today, Britain's Future, where they launched their local election campaign, about which, due to rules of purda, I'm frightened of saying anything else. But Angela's managed to turn up wearing a bright red jacket, standing in front of a bright red background. I don't know if you saw the early days of GBBs, when Andrew Neil managed to somehow appear wearing a, a dark black jacket in, in a dark black background. He looked a bit like the early days of Red Dwarf, when you had a sort of disembodied head floating around the screen without any apparent anchoring or, or purpose. It was Holly, wasn't it? It was Norman Lovett that played the, 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 that played the part. And anyway, Angela Rayner falling into a similar... Oh, hang on, breaking news. Y- Yvonne says that the hot cross bun flavoured cheese is delicious. Hey, can you tell, can you alert, can you alert Thomas Watts, please? The hot cross bun flavoured cheese that Morrison's is now selling is delicious. I, I Listen, one swallow does not a summer make any more than one Yvonne um, does a full... And Frank, uh, assessment of a hot... Actually, I quite like the sound of a hot cross bun flavoured cheese. And well done to Ruby for reminding us that Jesus actually said, blessed are the cheesemakers. Uh, seven minutes after ten is the time. Let's have a little flavour of what might be to come on the programme later. But I want to begin with a story. that, that I, I, I occasionally let myself do this, and I'm not going to lie to you. You don't always come with me. It doesn't always work. But stories that actually just make me go, well, why... why why don't we care more about this? But today's not quite in that category because a lot of people do care passionately uh, about the state of our rivers and our seas. I do, but it's very much one of those stories that only really gets the blood pumping on the days when it's in the news. It's what you really want is an issue that people are angry about or, or no, angry is the wrong word because that makes us all sound a bit gammony. You, you want an issue that makes us all really concerned all the time, not just when the media presses the button marked concern or marked anger. There is something, and the story about the boat race this week, I don't know if you saw it, should really have focused the mind. The boat race, the actual boat race, which, um, you know, is is probably the the closest that most of the population ever gets to uh, water sports. The boat race is... 
that have, have, have been warned not to throw their cocks into the water matron because of the detection of e coli in the river thames i, I have swum in the river i swam in the river thames not that long ago and i don't mean up up by where where is it where did king john sign the magna carta keith Come on, come on, mate. Jake, you're a historian. Where did King... Runnymede. So I used to go swimming at Runnymede during the uh, during the pandemic. When we were allowed to, I'd take the old kayak up to Runnymede and start paddling around there. But I've actually swum in the po- po- bit of the River Thames where the boat race goes. You're allowed to. What you've got to do... I will get to the topic eventually, but it's one of those days... You've got to look out for the slack tide. Did you know this? So you know the boys, the boys in the in the water. The the the. So a slack tide is when the boy in the water is upright, face like up. So if it's facing that way, this is obviously not something you can see unless you're watching later on the YouTube uh, recording of the entire program. Hi, YouTubers! Don't forget to subscribe. Hit those likes. Ding ding! Is it? ring that bell or something anyway so it can be going like that which means the tide is going that way or it can be going like that which means the tide is going that way or it can be like that which means the tide is slack and if if the tide is slack then the little bit of the river thames near where my mate lives you can you can jump in and have a bit of a swim i won't be doing that again if you can't throw your cocks into the water because of the e coli in the uh, system, then I, I highly advise that you don't go for a, for a sort of nice refreshing dip yourself when the weather gets hot. So that story focuses the mind a bit. But not enough. This is the thing I find extraordinary. Water companies in England have discharged... Just, just, just stop, actually. Not if you're driving or if you're doing something busy. Water companies in England have discharged... And if you do it in hours rather than quantity to start with, in, in, the, in the last 12 months, 3.6... What, what am I going to say next? 1,000? 3.600... Ta- 3, 300 and se- so how many hours did water companies in England spend treating... I, I beg your pardon, pumping raw sewage into our rivers and seas last year. 3.6 million hours. 3.6 million hours. If you're thinking, as I did briefly this morning, hang on a minute, there aren't 3.6 million hours in a year, then remember (laughs) that if 10 companies are pumping sewage into our rivers and our seas, at the same time for an hour, then that equals 10. I don't know that anyone except me needs this explaining, but I will explain it nonetheless. That means that there were 10 hours. Therefore, the number of hours in a year is not relevant to the number of hours that water companies may have spent during that year pumping untreated sewage, raw sewage. I, I, do you see what I mean about the, the words not reaching the places that they should reach? It's extraordinary. Uh, raw sewage, which is shocking amounts of ordure coming out of people, being discharged into our rivers and our seas for 3.6 million hours. It's, it's, it's pumping. It is discharging. It is not seeping or leaking or escaping. It is being deliberately and consciously pumped into our rivers and our seas for 3.6 million hours in a single year. Right, stop. What are you thinking? I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what? He's gone mad. Or, What? This is absolutely outrageous. This is truly... But why? Why weren't we angry about this 20 minutes ago? Don't phone me to tell me that you were. I'll come to you in a minute. Why weren't we angry about this 20 minutes ago? Why didn't we go to bed last night just inconceivably disturbed by the the simple statistics? Before I even tell you about what's going on at Thames Water financially, the simple statistics in place here should really have us all taking to the streets or marching for the hills or whatever it is that you do when you're very, very angry. Here's another number. 
A record number of migrants have crossed the channel this year, piling further pressure on Rishi Sunak to deliver on his Rwanda policy. Actually, I've got three. I've got another political intervention to share with you later that is up there with the stupidest of all time. No prizes for guessing who it involves. So 338 human beings crossed the channel yesterday in seven boats, taking the total to 4,664. I know this sounds silly, But could you imagine how the Conservative Party and their client journalists, the people who are still cheering for Boris Johnson, the people who told you that Brexit was a good idea, the people that gave Liz Truss a free pass into Parliament and the people who are currently obsessing about small boats while failing to do anything meaningful about them. Could you imagine what the country's coverage would look like if it could be proved that the 4,664 human beings who made their way here in perilous circumstances yesterday were responsible for the amount of sewage being discharged into our waterways. If you could somehow draw a causal link between the human beings in small boats and the 3.6 million hours in which raw, untreated sewage, literally shocking amounts of sewage, was being pumped into our waterways, I don't believe the story would ever be off the front pages. I don't think it would ever be off the lips of Rishi Sunak or uh, Kemi Badenoch or Jonathan Gullis or whoever gets put up this week to embarrass themselves with a ludicrous inability to grasp the simplest of facts while pursuing the most base of prejudices in the belief that their vote depends upon persuading already corrupted people that their lives are about to be rendered even worse, not by 14 years of Tory rule, but by some some poor soul in a dinghy. Could you imagine what the coverage of this would be like? If the coverage of sewage, if the sewage was somehow caused by immigration in general, or by wokeness, or by pronouns, could you imagine what the coverage... And yet, I think the only front page where the story appears today, and possibly the only newspaper in which it appears, is The Guardian. 2023 was the worst year for storm water pollution. Um... Uh, early figures were at 4 million but we reckon it's going to be closer to about 3.6 so I've got two questions for you one is philosophical or political and one is personal I I find we're increasingly doing this we're sort of splitting peeling the onion on the program so do the why of it why because if it wasn't for Fergal Sharkey I'm not even sure that the levels of anger and concern that we've reached would have been reached Fergal's managed to somehow because he's a great communicator that's the thing about poets and artists is that they have powers of communication that the, the rest of us sometimes lack and, and quite unexpectedly Fergal one of the greatest songwriters of his or indeed any other generation has has, has purely from a place of authenticity and concern. Born originally, if you don't know, of his love of chalk streams and trout fishing. It's what introduced him to the damage, the impact, the dangers of pumping unprecedented amounts of... Can I say that? Can I say that? Really? Okay, poo. Unprecedented amounts of poo into our waterways. Ferg- if it wasn't for Fergal, I'm not even sure that we would feel the levels of concern and uh, anger, yes, anger, that we, um, that we feel today. So why? Uh, theoretically, what, what, what do we need to live? Shelter, food, water. Theoretically, and I know that our drinking water is for now still drinkable, but, but the, you don't have to be a, a, a meteorologist or a geologist or any form of scientist to understand that, that polluting our waterways is a horrific way for human beings to behave. So why why does this not Why haven't we gone after the people who've taken millions of pounds out? Partly because we don't know who they are. I don't know. I want your answers. Why why is the state of sewage discharge, why is the story of sewage discharge, in your view, not the biggest story in town? Don't ring me to tell me that something else is more important. Ring me to tell me why you feel this doesn't connect with people in the way that I think... Logically, it should, and in a slightly different universe, I believe it could. All right? Hit the numbers now. You will get through. 0345 6060 Why do you think something as, 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 as simply stunning as this statistic, 3.6 million hours in England, 
spent pumping raw sewage into our rivers and our seas. Why, why has this not set our world on fire? Do you think, honestly, hand on heart, and don't hold back if you think your answer's a bit obvious. The best thing we can do is assemble as many as possible. And then the second question, which is, you're not in the category I've just described. Something has happened in your life that has made you very alive. Perhaps you were a cox that got to tossed into the Thames. And as a consequence of the E. coli presence there, you were incredibly ill. Something in your life, because most of us don't do water sports. Most of us don't engage in, 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 in the waterways in the way that perhaps you do. So what was it that happened in your life that made you realise just what a national tragedy this is? And I don't think there's much debate about what's caused it. It's the same reason the railways are up the spout. It's because people look upon the things that we rely on and think are somehow infrastructurally immune from the profit imperative. We naively think, oh, well, no, the water won't be treated like any other commodity. Railway travel won't be treated like any other commodity. But that's why these things happen. They are looked at like care homes are now. Anything people look at and think, how can we make money out of that? Stuff the customers. Screw the customers. Absolutely forget about the customers, the consumers, whatever you want to call them. The inmates, the patients, the residents, the drinkers, the, the, the travellers. How can we get more money out of this for as long as we possibly can, even as the service that we provide gets worse and worse and worse, the profits that we derive get better and better and better. That's how it happens. But that adds to the first question of why we should be angrier. So why doesn't it land like it should? And why and how did it land with you? Thank you. It's 20 past 10. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 23 minutes after 10. One of the many, uh, well, there are plenty of advantages, but um, I, I do like the crowdsourcing element of the programme that the WhatsApp number has now allowed us to engage even more enthusiastically. So Mark and Andy and many others have done the sums for us. And it's about 400 years worth. If it was non-stop, if it was the non-stop discharge of untreated sewage into English rivers and seas, it would take about 400 years for the 2023 amount alone to be released. So, well, you know the questions. Chris is in Wokingham. Chris, what do you reckon? Hey, James. Hello, so Chris. It's, it's just a really sad state of affairs, isn't it? Because... Everyone's say that again. connected from it. You turn your tap on at home. Yeah. You've got clean water. Everything's fine. Thames Water, Southern Water, whoever your water company is, you pay the bill to them. There's no competition. It, it is what it is. And it yeah, works. but everybody, I guarantee you, without, I'm not blowing my own trumpet, but by 10 past 10 today, every single person listening to this program would have been in a state of shocked disbelief. Or, or head-shaking knowledge and, oh my God, why aren't you talking about this every day, James? This is the single most important thing in my life. There, there, there would have been nobody listening to that introduction going, meh. I think, I think I've shocked yeah. him into silence. There wouldn't have yeah, been. No, there it, wouldn't it, have been. It, there, it's there, right. Well, I think my, my default answer would be to say that, you know, it's not going to win votes. But then you sort of think about it. Well, surely it could if you actually pledged to invest in that infrastructure and to stop the profit how can it not exiting, so you think you think it's di dis disconnection we don't we don't most i guess i mean how many people li even live near even if you do live near a river you very rarely will see the consequences of what we're describing because it's so quickly flushed out to sea which is the sort of point of location of the of the storm uh, uh, pipes and the the whole system but uh, you read a story about the boat race and you think well i'm not a cox in a boat right? do, do you think that why, why do you care what is it in your life that has brought you closer to the story well i think there's a couple of reasons i think 2020 was an important year so many people were out on the waterways yes. and kayaks through lockdown and that was a, a realization of oh yeah look, look there's all this available let's go swim and let's do this and i was blissfully unaware of the state of affairs mm. i'm nearly 40 and my perception has been that the water was cleaner than ever yeah. things were improving the environment's in a in a better place in this country and then the reality is that's not the case i've got friends that live on the coast who are constantly having to check various apps to see whether they can go swimming in the sea and most of the time they they shouldn't but yeah. sometimes they do 
I did a kayaking trip last year. We did the length of the Y, which is on the England Wales border. Oh, yeah, I know the Y. Beautiful. beautiful, beautiful spot. And we did that over a few days. And for large stretches of it, there is signs saying do not swim. Although that's got a slightly different cause. That's because of farmers flushing out a lot of their yes, chemicals as well. The river. But either way, it's so sad that you're in what seems to be paradise. And it's like, nope. <laughs> you can't, you can't, <laughs> go, you can't get in the water. And I, I, I mean, I, I, people are free to speculate on what the political reasons may be. Uh, things have got measurably worse since Brexit or since 2016. But I don't know whether that is because of a, um, a relaxation of regulation or, or, or a less robust imposition of, of scrutiny and service. When you do that, briefly, Chris, do, do, is it is it organised? Does somebody else arrange where you sleep and stop along the way and stuff like that? Or do you do it all yourself? Yeah, that was really just a, a bit of planning uh, between me and a couple of friends. So, yeah, really... So you, you schlep, you schlep, you, you pull the kayak out of the water and then you've arranged where you're going to stay that night? Either that or completely legally wild camp. Oh, wow, well, lovely. That'd be nice as well. I, I love that part of the world. It's one of my favourite parts of the world. Ross on Y, Hay on Y. The bookshops in Hay on Y remain one of my kind of all-time favourite destinations. Thank you, mate. Ben's in Exeter. Ben, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Yeah, so I've uh, recently moved down to Exeter from Bradford in West Yorkshire. Oh, yeah. Why is that? And, uh, have you been to Bradford? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, to be fair, Brad- Bradford's a great city, but I-, I had an opportunity to move down here. And we yeah. really like it down here. Holidayed down here and what have you and got the opportunity. So, so me and my wife moved Lovely. down. Now, in, when I was up in West Yorkshire, the the sewage, I was aware of it, but you don't think much of it because you, you're landlocked, you, you've not got a coast for miles. Is that right? And and I think that the, a lot of the population, it's just, it's not an everyday thing you think about because unless you're going to throw yourself in the canal, you don't worry about the water quality. Whereas moving down yeah. here, all of a sudden, we see basically how they've devastated the, the coastline and it's Southwest Water doing it down here. You know, Thames water. What do you mean when, when you say devastated the coastline? What do you mean? Pumped it full of waste. But, um, but what can you see? How does that... How, how, I mean, is it just signs up saying <laughs> don't go in? Or, I mean, is it is it grimmer no. than that even? Well, the, a couple of weeks ago in Exmouth, the, the only time that Southwest Water had stopped polluting the sea was when, when they stopped pumping effluent into the sea and they pumped it into the town centre. Uh, one of the local parks, so it it, it is visible often. Um, and so, so, and so, around where you are, and a mate of mine's just moved to Exeter actually as well. Is is it is it a high level of interest? Is it a big topic of conversation? Is yeah. it something? Uh, so we've got a kind of yeah. post, postcode, not lottery, but a but a postcode uh, factor kicking in. Whereas right. if you live near the sea, if you live on a river, if you live near the discharge, it's going to be one of the biggest issues in, in your life. But if you don't, it simply isn't. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't think, and you know, people have enough to focus on that. If you're living in, in Bradford, yeah. you know, Manchester, you probably, it's not top of your list. Um, but I, I think that you, you made your second point about, you know, is it political and, and, and why does it not get the recognition? So I think aside from people not seeing it, when you look at the politics, the Tories are not going to be interested in highlighting more of their own corruption or... Or, or telling potential a, donors to wind their neck in. Yeah, because we've just funded South West Water's profits. They've been paid money to fix the sewage system over decades they've not done it they've, they've this isn't unique by any means i know you know this it's not you un- unique to southwest water the figures we, we, we revise we revisit the figures every time we talk about this issue that the amount of money taken out of the water companies over the last few years is absolutely extraordinary and, and southwest is your speciality thames is in the news at the moment because they have they, they've run out of money and shareholders who've uh, you know taken millions and millions out are struggling or rather refusing to give them more money unless the bills are put up so the customers are going to be hit over the head with that i don't know though i mean you're obviously right but i it, you know I, people who live in all the places you've just listed aren't likely to be affected by a trigger warning on a shakespeare production in a small theater in south london but there are elements of the media that will be chasing down stories like that on an almost daily basis so how can the introduction of poo to our waterways be less exciting to 
elements of our media than a, a, a trigger warning on a production of Macbeth in Stoke Newington or whatever this week's Woke Watch should be focusing on. I don't quite get that. Is that psychology rather than geography? Yeah, be- because if you, if you were getting annoyed that Easter eggs don't say Easter on them, yes. that a made-up story like that, there's a reason why you're getting annoyed about things like that because yeah. you're embarrassed about the state of the, you know, you've had every vote go your way for the last 15 years. And there you are. And so, so why would I get bothered about... Can't, war don't blame me. Let look for things me. that I can't be blamed on all the people I've voted for, all the things that I've have helped facilitate. So I'm going to get angry with things I haven't facilitated at all, except small boats, of course, which is a direct consequence of Tory policy and 14 years of Tory rule, but which the Tory party is banking on voters um, being so cross about that they'll vote for the Tory party again. It's a funny old world. 10.32 is the time. My mate Luke, by the way, is doing Krav Maga lessons. Do you, do you, have you, how are you? Are you fit, Ben? Are you in a fit state? And all that? Are you... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, if you ask my wife, I'm, I'm not as fit as I used to be, uh, but, but trying to get Self-defence? You're any good at self-defence? Can you look after yourself if, some, if you got into I, a bit of bother I, on a dark night in an alleyway? I saw you tweet the other day. Check it out. We'll look him up. So yeah. seriously, it's in your neck of the woods. I, I, I don't know if there's any discount for being a, 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 a job, ten percent job discount. But he's a good lad, and he's really, really good. He loves his Krav Maga. Ten thirty-three is the time. Thomas Watts has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Ten thirty-seven is the time. I, I've, it's Thursday, isn't it? So Miss Jarrett, twelve. And I've got three stories. So Henry Riley will join us at 11.45 to cover at least one of them. There are two others, two stories of almost unbelievable political incompetence that I am keen to share with you today. Shall, shall we Shall we do one now? Shall we? I think we should do one now, and then we'll get back to the waterways. Do, do you know who has been made... You know 30p Lee left the Tory party. Let me just check with the producer. What party is he in this week? Do we know? Are we... No? Okay. Anyway, he's not in the Tory party anymore, 30 p He was in the Labour party at the last uh, uh, 2015 election, the Tory party in the 2019 election. He resigned as deputy chairman of the Tory party so that he could vote against the Rwanda bill. But then he went into the lobby to vote against the Rwanda bill and people started sniggling. So he didn't vote against the Rwanda bill. I think he abstained instead. And then he got fired for being... I think it was Islamophobic comments about Sadiq Khan. So you get fired as deputy chairman, but if you're a 15 million quid donor, that's all fine. Um, and and they had to replace him. So they found a new deputy chairman of the Tory party. Now, if you, if you were to set aside all sympathy for satirists and answer this question honestly, if you were trying to undo some of the damage caused by making Lee Anderson... Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party, who is the very last person you would replace him with? I'm going to say that again because the words are important. If you were trying to undo some of the damage, because it was, you know, an absolute humiliation for Sunak in so many ways to see someone that he had personally promoted not only resign from the position he was promoted to, but then leave the party altogether for reasons that are still not entirely clear. If you were trying to undo some of the damage done by promoting a dunderhead like 30p lee anderson who is the last person on earth that you would replace him with as deputy chairman of the conservative party all together now yeah here's jonathan gullis on sky news with sophie ridge the other night those pesky peers in the house of lords predominantly labor and labor mps and sakir starm in the house of commons are continuing to block any attempts that we make in order to get this Rwanda policy off the ground, because one, it will act as an effective deterrent, but you need it, as with all the other measures, to make sure that we have that plans. You abstained the Rwanda vote, didn't you? Well, actually, I voted in favour of the National and Borders Act and voted for the Illegal Migration Act. And with the Rwanda bill, what I made very clear was that I wanted to see the bill pass. So I didn't block or deter it at any point. But you, I you suggested some amendments. You? Well, I suggested amendments, Sophie, and obviously that's a matter of public record. Did you, that did you could... abstain or not on the Rwanda bill? <laughs> I, uh, Sophie, that's a matter of public record. But I did choose to abstain on that particular bill. <laughs> but You're I didn't one of the You can't blame I'm the like pesky Labour peers. You didn't I vote for it. Actually, Sophie, I can actually, Sophie, because at the end of the day, I haven't voted like Labour have over 90 times to block the Rwanda scheme from being able to take place. You I abstained on it. You didn't vote for it. <laughs> you can't think it was that great. You didn't vote for it. 
Sophie, there's a very clear difference here between saying that you want something to work, you believe in Rwanda, as I do, and I want Rwanda to work, as then I do. Then why did you vote for it? The Prime Minister does. But obviously I had, with that particular bill, a couple of amendments that I wanted to see be adopted. And that, of course, is it, it, it is on, on the issue of amendments that Labour peers continue to send the bill back to the House of Commons. Amendments including, let's not deport people who worked with the British Army. Let's not deport people who helped our troops in Afghanistan. Let's not deport people who are proven victims of modern slavery. Those kind of little details that Jonathan Gullis is in favour of, but some of the peers, including, of course, some very eminent Tory peers who must be, I don't know quite what the phrase would be, but in freefall at what their party has become in subsequent years. Do you know, nobody got that wrong. That's actually extraordinary. As I see so many texts and WhatsApps coming into the studio now. We need to sort of, I don't know, slow it down somehow as I can't keep up. But nobody got that wrong. I don't think the word gullis has been typed so many times, uh, a, a, probably in human history, or at least since he was a teacher. Do you know this story? It was a teacher and some of the kids put together, a, they put his head on a picture of a seagull and he absolutely lost his lunch. Reportedly. I mean, I mean it may not be true either way, but I, 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 I kind of find it sadly far too easy to believe. Um, in fact, I would go so far as to say that the very thought of it makes me sniggle. It's 10.41, back to the waterways. Alex is in Leicester. Alex, what do you think? What's going on? Hi, James. Hello. Uh, what I was going to say to you, I think there's a massive disconnect between the public and actually where their water comes from. Yes, yes, Most I people do. seem to think that they just turn the tap on and it appears and it comes from a reservoir. But also, I mean, you go shopping at the weekend, the amount of people buying bottled water as well. Yes. It just doesn't. Click. I mean, I think if it came out the tap and it was a horrible muddy brown water colour, I think people would be more sort of like concerned about it. Yes. But the whole thing you were saying. Well, they are it, when it is, of course. It does occasionally happen, yeah, doesn't it? It's... Every so often it does happen. But because we have such stringent things with regards to our water in this country, it very rarely happens. And I think people just don't make that connection as such. I know you referred to sort of like emergency yeah. discharges earlier in the show. I mean, this has been going on for absolute donkey's years. Um, about seven years ago, I was working as an environmental advisor um, along the Solent and Southern Water okay. were up to their old tricks then. And what they would call it would be storm discharges, but yes. it wouldn't be during a storm. So every time it rained, pretty much they would just let go this untreated sewage yes. straight into the Solent. So that would probably account for a lot of the hours that you've got. Yes, of course. I mean, I think they are technically all called storm discharges, but 3.6 million hours of storm discharges, people are going to be wondering when all these storms happened. Exactly. And they just use that every time it rains as a convenient excuse just to let go of it. What's changed then? You're a bit closer to the action than I am. I mean, is it as simple as saying that if you give all the money to the shareholders and spend none of it on infrastructure and improvement, then eventually everything's going to get measurably worse? And in the context of a water company, measurably worse means sewage in the water. Yeah, I think also the fact that we aren't held to account by what was the Water Framework Directive originally, which, of course, was a part of EU legislation. We voted to get rid of that. So now that we're not held to account by that either. Do you think that's a big part of it? That's because I, I mean, think that's it, an extremely it, big part yeah, of it. Yeah, well, it wouldn't surprise me. What do you think Britain's privatised water and sewage companies paid in dividends in 2022? Go on, have a guess. I have absolutely no idea, but I would imagine it being billions. <laughs> Well, it is indeed in billions, £1.4 billion in dividends to shareholders. And, uh, and at yeah. Thames Water in particular, the, those self-same shareholders are now refusing mm. to give more money to the water giant to uh, yeah. to fix the problems we're describing and telling them instead to put up bills. Absolutely believe it. And also the fact that a lot of the shareholders aren't based in this country. I mean, for example, things like South East Water, they have Australian shareholders. They're well, this is, a, this, is a, this, is a, this is a fine Tory tradition. Because uh, yeah. sometimes it'll be foreign governments even that, that own uh, some of our uh, institutions and, and utilities. I think the China Investment Corporation yeah. owns, a, owns a fat slice of Thames water. So the Tories are, are great enthusiasts for the state ownership of public utilities, but mm. only when it's foreign states. Yeah, when it's exactly. our own state that wants to own the railways or, or own the water companies or, or own energy companies, they are passionately opposed to it. But when yeah. it's France or China or Australia, they're all for it. Yeah, because then they can just pick it overseas. It doesn't concern them. But as long as they're getting that money rolling in, they're absolutely I wonder how bad. many shareholders are donors. Alex, thank you. I mean, I, this is one of those stories where there's no 
pushback, you know, even if you spend your life desperately trying to persuade yourself that you haven't been sold pup after pup after pup since 2010 and that your votes for Cameron and, and Theresa May and, and, uh, and, and Boris Johnson and Brexit, and it, all, it was all definitely the right thing to do and Labour would have been much worse and it's all Remainer's fault that so everything has gone badly. Even if you listen to this programme as a form of penance, as a form of masochism, because you are part of the problems that we describe every day, this is a story that you can't even begin to push back on. You can't say, no, this has got nothing to do with the, the kind of people that donate money to the Tory party, absolutely rinsing our uh, national infrastructure for personal profit while leaving everybody else to swim in shocking amounts of sewage. There's, no, there's literally no pushback. Oh, stop being so naive or stop being such a lefty. There's no way, there's no way you can go with this, which is possibly, conversely, counterintuitively, that might be an answer to the question about why it doesn't resonate more, because everybody knows it would. So that's why it's only on the front page of The Guardian today, because most of the other newspapers have been a huge part of putting us in the position that we're in, whether you're talking about water companies or trade or whether you're talking about the economy or the cost of living or whatever it may be, or, or indeed the absolute flotsam and jetsam that now populates the upper echelons of our government. If, if you as a member of the media were part of that... It would be hard to go deep on the water story, if you pardon the pun, because, well, like almost everything else that's gone wrong in this country since 2010, but especially 2016, you are complicit in the problem. It's 10.46. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.51, some breaking-ish news for you. The official figures that... Um, look at the state of the British economy have been released. These are the revisions of the ones that were found last month to have um, uh, delivered recession, to have put the UK into recession. But sometimes, as you know, the, the revised figures, when a slightly more um, detailed uh, uh, evidence becomes available, the, 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 the figures and therefore the depictions, the definitions can be revised. That so-called double dip recession, by, for example, in 2011, um, when George Osborne was Chancellor, was eventually found not to have actually happened. The numbers weren't quite there for uh, the definition of recession. But the Office of National Statistics has now double-checked its sums and concluded that the UK economy did indeed go into recession at the end of last year, with the latest estimate finding it contracted in the last two quarters of 2023. Uh, listen, I, I, I am no fan of this government, as you know, so you can probably trust me more than anyone else when I say I don't think it will last. I do think that the oil tanker has probably already turned around, but for a man whose entire premiership is supposed to be built on fiscal genius or at least fiscal responsibility, and of course who at the beginning of last year was probably promising that this sort of thing was going to be uh, dealt with very, very swiftly. It's an epic humiliation for Rishi Sunak, um, and one that no doubt he'll seek to blame on the boogie. Uh, it's 10.52. Back to the waterways. I've got two more stories for you of, frankly, epic. I can't believe they've all come along at once. Honestly, you wait days for examples of politicians behaving like complete prunes, and then three, although one of them's not a proper politician, and then three come along at once and vie for the title of biggest Muppet of the Week. So we, we had um, Jonathan Gullis uh, uh, complaining about Labour peers not voting for the Rwanda bill in the House of Lords and being reminded by the inimitable Sophie Ridge of Sky News that he didn't vote for that bill either when he had the opportunity in the House of Commons. <laughs> I said it before and I'll say it again. It's a satirist I feel sorry for. In the next hour, we'll, we'll come across two more, um, one of which Henry Riley will tell us about, but only as an adjunct to a story that you may have heard about without fully understanding. It's the Veterans Minister, Johnny Mercer, who faces a very real possibility of going to jail if he refuses to reveal the sources who have told him about British troops committing war crimes in Afghanistan between 2001 and 2021. It's, it's, a, it, I, it's probably quite a complicated story, both uh, evidentially and morally, and that may be why I haven't managed to get my head fully around it. And whenever I find myself not having got my head fully around a, a, an interesting story, I like to dispatch young Henry to, uh, to get to the bottom of things. So he'll be joining us um, in just under an hour. Before that, back into the water. Eamon is in Woodbridge in Suffolk, a lovely part of the world. Eamon, what would you like to say? Hi, James. How are you? Very well. What's on your mind? James, uh, it's water is on my mind almost constantly. Um, really? I'm the chair... 
Yeah, yeah, funnily enough. I'm the chair of uh, a, a small outfit called the Deep Climate Centre. So te- f- we're going to have to try and sort your phone light out, Eamon. Phone light? Phone line even. I do apologise. Jennifer is in Dorset. Jennifer, what made you pick up the phone? Um, well, everyone's going on about um, the, the effluent going into the water streams. We've actually got it going down our street. Every few weeks, we get a little email coming round saying, you can't go down this particular area because the, well, I won't give a name, they probably know Wessex Water, right. is digging up the street because they burst. They're so old, you see. If you go and down the wa- to the street today, you're in for a big surprise. Exactly. The water, we're on Chalk Stream as well. Oh. So the water doesn't flow down, does it, into the down through the grass and the uh, the land so the water like today i mean it's going to be you know we're we're waiting for a a note from them an email from them it comes down the from uh, into the into the river down the stream down the bottom it puts pressure on the uh pipes and they're old pipes i must say that they that gives the impression that they're doing the the water water board wessex water are doing it on purpose but it is the fact they haven't got any money to dig the whole lot up. Well, I'm so they're not doing surprised it they're, giving, they're giving billions of pounds to shareholders every year. Well, There's not yes, going to be any is, money left over for that, replacing pipes. Don't be so ridiculous. What are you, a communist? That's, <laughs> that's the fault, obviously, of the ages ago when they went into a limited company. They do come um, whenever, and also I must say that some, sometimes buildings, uh, building new um properties that push a, puts a pressure on and we developers, have a aren't, of dis- developers aren't always required to ensure that they're that putting in the infrastructure that's needed to to, to lessen the blow to what's that, already that's in right place. but here in dorset they're a bit more responsible i must say because we've had oh, a couple of, deve- couple of developments going on in our area and they do insist on the planning to have someone a report to say whether it's going to put too much pressure and in fact they've They've done that now. Well, this is, this is all that regulation and red thing. tape that Jacob rees t- keeps telling us that we want less of. Briefly, Jennifer, I, I mean, how unpleasant is the, the the fluid that makes its way down your street? Well, you don't see... You don't see lumps, put it that way. <laughs> You're a poet. <laughs> You're a poet, <laughs> Jennifer, and you don't know it. <laughs> By the time it gets through, obviously, it's... Um, but there's it's little, there's little doubt about, about what was once a lump. Oh yeah, but it'll be reduced down, won't it? It'll be as if it's uh, uh, it in, in the water. It'll be uh, now. It'll be dirty, dirty rain, and it, dirty it does. Rain. It does smell, albums. and it's it's not healthy. Oh, and we've it also, smells. We're, cov- we're, we're, we're we're surrounded by farms, obviously. So you've got the added problem of, of runoff and and some of the pesticides and the added. Well, this again, I, I hate to labour this point, but someone has to. These are the regulations and the red tape that everyone voted to get rid of in 2016. You literally wanted more shocking amounts of sewage making their way down your street martin's texted to ask james why do you keep extending the shush sound when you say shocking amounts of sewage if you can't work that out i can't help you all right it's to give keith a heart attack because he thinks i'm going to say a rudy I'm, I'm cracking on jennifer only because i sensed that eamon had some interest some, some equally interesting contributions to make and i'm very short of time eamon back to you hi james sorry about the line it's not your um, fault yeah i I run an outfit called the uh, Demon Climate Centre uh, with uh, quite a few other people. And we've been testing water on the River Devon in Suffolk for two years, testing for E. coli and phosphate. And we regularly find all the way up the river, it's got an estuary, but it's also got a non-tidal part. Right. And all the way from the mouth down to the, to the sea at Felixstowe, we find uh, huge levels of E. coli and of phosphate. Are you are you surprised by the lack of I mean I know it does get reported and I know that Fergal Sharkey is doing extraordinary work in this field and I know that we turn our attention to it and some of my colleagues do as well more often than we ever have done before but but being so close to the action so to speak does it surprise you that it's not a bigger issue a bigger story Well it's a big it's a big issue around here very yeah. locally yeah. Um, but but you know, and everybody is aware now. Nobody was aware two years ago right. before we. Uh, we managed to get uh, Anglian Water to agree to put a, a sanitisation plant into a wonderful place called Marksham Creek, which was renamed Sh Creek. Thank you. Uh, locally. Yes. And um, have you ever have you ever been there without a paddle, Eamon? 
<laughs> I've never been in the water in that no, place. Good God, I should hope not. So, I mean, that's the but, only thing that's ever going to improve things, when these companies start spending money on, on infrastructure and improvement. Well, it is, but the, the tail end of this story is that uh, nine months ago, uh, designated bathing water status was granted to a small village called Wardringfield, which is just downstream oh, lovely. from Mark. From yes. How, however, oh. the sanitization plant, which was promised by Anglian Water and uh, and so on, and agreed by Defra, um, basically has not arrived. So the, the first the first uh, summer's assessment of the bathing water status, of course, is poor. So it's failed. well, colour me shocked. Uh, you'll appreciate this. It's, it's not not the company you refer to, but it's the owners of Thames Water. I shall run through them in no particular. Well, actually, in descending order of stake how big a stake there are here it goes these are the external shareholders of thames water ontario municipal employees retirement system um, the university superannuation scheme so that is a uk pension scheme then you've got a subsidiary of the abu dhabi investment authority then you've got the british columbia investment management corporation then you've got hermes um, independent specialists in global private markets uh, and then you've got the china investment corporation the queensland investment corporation aquila gp um, which I think, I don't think is British, but I could be wrong, and I'm pretty sure this one isn't. Then you've got Stichting Pension von Sorge en Welgein, which I don't think is English. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Four minutes after 11 is the time. Um, it, it, it feels, uh, people forget when people wish you a happy Easter. It doesn't really become happy until Sunday, which is, of course, Easter Day. Tomorrow is Good Friday which um, obviously commemorates the crucifixion of Christ. I don't know why, but the story coming from the United Nations at the moment about starvation being used as a weapon in Gaza just sort of made Easter this year feel a little bit more poignant for me because um, the, 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 the sense of suffering, not just there but elsewhere in the world as well, Seems, seems a little bit more acute at the moment. Ukraine, I, I, a very depressing piece in the Times today about the possible fall of Kiev if the West doesn't get its act together shortly and start providing them with more, um, more weapons. But I'm going to talk about religion until quarter to 12. Now, I, I wonder how many people just went, oh, never mind, I'll turn it off, I'll put on some music. I hope you didn't. I hope I've gr just grabbed you in the nick of time. Because you, 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 you hear an awful lot about the negatives of religion, even on this program, about fundamentalism, about extremism, about hypocrisy. And we also hear a lot more about religions other than Christianity than we used to do, largely, sadly, for, for negative reasons. Um, uh, any British Muslim will tell you that since the September the 11th terror attacks, their life has changed irredeemably, irrevocably. Their life has changed uh, uh, extraordinarily. The last person to tell me that in an interview co context was the former chairman of the Conservative Party, Baroness. Saeed Avasi, and uh, you know, there's always been abuse, there's always been racism, there's always been prejudice, but what was once quite generic for anyone with brown skin has become, since the uh, rise of Islamist terrorism, has become much more religion specific. So the P word going into a form of retreat and being attacked simply for the religion that you subscribe to becoming grounds for, for all sorts of abuses um, and from all corners of society, not just from the sort of national front end of the picture, but right up to and including people that write for Andrew Neil's Spectator magazine, for, for example, Islamophobia or, or the hatred of Muslims or the insistence that all Muslims should somehow be punished or held accountable for the actions of terrorists has become commonplace um, in in. Uh, upper echelons of the Tory party as well so we don't talk about Christianity much anymore which also has plenty of negatives in its history you know you, you don't have to go for the greatest hits like the Spanish Inquisition or, or, or something like that you could look at um, the, the history of Christianity in England the, the history of Christianity in Britain have a look at the astonishing yo-yoing of of murderous supposedly religious persecution between just three monarchs Henry VIII followed by his two daughters but so I, I, I mention all of that just to remind you that the negatives are constantly discussed and are and, and Christianity is almost only ever used I think very cynically and very inauthentically by people who never live by never seem to live by Christian values I appeared in a, in a 
country's top 50 Catholics not long ago. Or, or top 100, I can't remember. But I, some of the people that were also on that list, I think most obviously Jacob rees Morgany and Duncan Smith, seem to me to be subscribers to and promoters of policies that couldn't be further removed from the stuff that I studied when I was at a monastic boarding school and the stuff that I, I hear from the pulpit and sometimes have the, the pleasure of sharing myself from the lectern when, when I am in church. Now, I'll get the personal stuff out of the way early. I, I, I oscillate. I'm in a down period at the moment. Faith for me is a, is a very impermanent thing. Uh, sometimes I'm consciously, acutely conscious of the absurdity of the whole shebang. I spent most of my 20s thinking it was ridiculous, pushing back furiously against... Uh, what had been inflicted upon me by various nuns and monks and priests, pretty much from the cradle. My late father, however, was very devout. So when he died, much to my own surprise, I, I, I had a bit of a reverse before he died, actually. Um, uh, but we had a bit of a reverse. I found myself going to church very, very regularly again for the opportunity both of therapy and of, of talking to him. Actually, I, I, I used to catch myself talking to dad. I talked to dad in two places more than any other. One is in church and one is watching Kidderminster Harriers play football because it was one of the last things we did together before he died. Uh, and, I, I mean, to be fair, the Catholic tradition of penance and, and, uh, uh, and self-punishment fits pretty neatly into both categories, whether you're watching Kiddy or whether you're in church uh, reflecting upon the sacrifices made by the Christ. You, 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 you're, you're moving into similarly sacrificial territory. But this week, something weird happened to me. And, and I'd, I'd like to talk to you about it very briefly before we spend a moment to mark easter by looking at the the benefits the benefits the positives of religious faith because you can send me all the messages you want telling me that it's all a load of nonsense and i don't believe in any sky fairies and look, most of the time nor do i these days but i think i probably will again but you can't argue with the statistics which are just weird and people who have religious faith are generally happier and better adjusted than people who don't i mean if you wanted to be cynical you could say there's a reason why we invented god we invented God because it helps. I, I, we have a very r strange relationship with death in this country. But if you think that your loved ones are in paradise, it's a hell of a lot easier to cope with death than it is if you think that they're worm food, isn't it? Not Maybe not for you, but generally speaking, faith delivers all sorts of positives that often get glossed over. But the thing, the weird thing, I'm going to play quite a long clip now and then, then we'll get stuck right into it. Actually, no, I'll play the... Well, wait and see. I, I was with the Archbishop of Canterbury late last week, and I don't think... And remember, I spent almost all of my formative years with, with monks in particular, and, and when I was very young with nuns. I don't think I've ever heard anybody speak in quite the way he does about... Jesus. Now, even as I say the word Jesus there, there's a little bit of me that's laughing, right? Or sniggering, or becoming self-conscious. And that's what I found unique about Justin Welby, is that when we moved into this territory, and he is my guest on Full Disclosure this week, and it covers an awful lot of ground. We touch upon Rwanda, we touch upon politics, the role of the House of Lords. I think Jonathan Gullis makes an appearance, believe it or not, because he said that priests are spending too much time in the pulpit, preaching from the pulpit which means he doesn't really understand what a priest is or a pulpit, but it's Jonathan Gullis, so no major surprises there. I can't remember someone speaking about Jesus in such an authentic fashion without any apparent need to qualify it or to self-centre. I can't do it. I just told you then. I say the word Jesus, and automatically in my head I'm thinking, what can I say to insulate myself from the fact that you think I'm silly? There's something really extraordinary which is the word I'm using far too much at the moment. A couple of you have noticed. I'll try to, I'll find a new one for next week. There's something truly remarkable about pure faith. I don't think we see it very often. Quite often when people insist that they're Catholics or Christians or preach, tweet hallelujah every Easter, they are what I guess you'd have to call virtue signaling. Quite often they're making excuses for their lives and their politics by saying, no, 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 I'm a Christian. You saw a lot of this in the 19th century. You know, you might own a mill where children are having their backs broken, making you richer, but you go to church every Sunday and have your own pew up the front with a little plaque on it, so you must be going straight to heaven. Catholics used to have indulgences where you could literally buy or give money 
to buy a bit of the cross, which was very unlikely to be a bit of the actual cross. And, and you'd buy an indulgence and it would sort of get you, it would cancel out some of your sins. Confession in the Catholic Church is not the same because it doesn't involve privilege, but it, it does involve the notion of a scales and balances that you can fix. So you very rarely encounter somebody who is talking, who is not talking about Christianity because they're trying to convince you that they're a good person brackets when they're probably not closed brackets you put me in that category if you want i don't think it's fair but i can live with it I, I listen to politicians talking about being christians or being catholics and usually it seems to me that they're saying no 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 no. the things i actually do and vote for might be disgusting and cruel and callous and mean but i go to church every sunday so i can't possibly be a disgusting and callous and cruel and mean person so so often when people are telling you about their faith or their religion, they're not really doing it in an authentic fashion. They're doing it in quite a self-interested and fraudulent fashion. And then I sat down with the Archbishop of Canterbury last week. This is quite a long clip, but I really want you to listen to it. It, 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 it is Easter, after all, and it is a conversation that we don't have very often and won't have very often, but must and should have every now and then. I met someone called Simon Barrington Ward at a party. He was a friend of the people who were having the party and was a clergyman. And he seemed very nice. He went on, I met him later because he went on to be Bishop of Coventry, hmm. which was, and he ordained me as it happened. Of course. And um, he invited me to go and he was running the Church Missionary Society. And he invited me to go and they had a, program seven month eight month teaching in kenya in right out in the middle of nowhere and i did that and i found myself in this was 1974 it was only 10 years after independence for mm. kenya and i was in a school that was built on the site of a former internment camp during the Mau Mau uprising of the 1950s what they called the emergency mm. um and the head teacher there was remarkable because he'd been interned uh, by the Brits. And there was no resentment. And he was a Christian. And for the first time, I met people who, for whom God wasn't a concept or an idea, but someone they knew. And that completely blew my mind and blew open the resistance, the the complacent and arrogant ignorance with which I'd been living at school, that this was just tomfoolery because this was so genuine. And um, that really opened the way to me at the end of, at the beginning of my second year at university, stopping running away from the God I realized existed and being willing to turn around and open up my life to Jesus Christ with a complete lack of, well, no, not complete, a half lack of faith. Mm. So a prayer at, which said, God, I don't know if you exist, but if you do, I'd like you to be in charge of my life. Mm. And just finding then something, uh, a presence, a reality in life that changed the whole way the world looked. What what was it then about the head teacher? Was, was it that he felt God had guided him through what could have been an unbearable experience? No, he didn't hate. He wasn't bitter. He was patient. He was paid three fifths of nothing at all. Yes. And he loved the kids. And they were some of them quite difficult. And he just had a deep set, gentle and gracious humanity about the way he behaved. And you felt that he was deriving that in part through faith? I felt that it came from his faith. Yes. Yeah. And we'd sit and talk. He was very realistic about the problems of Kenya at the time. But when I said to him on one occasion, well, you, know, you, you keep talking about corruption and you keep talking about this and you keep talking about that. And he said... I said, well, you said it was better under the British. And he said, yes, it was in some ways. But you need to remember it's never better to be ruled 
by a foreign power. Mm. It's never good to be a colony. We'd have to take responsibility for our own future. And, um, but he didn't do it bitterly at all. And the other thing, I shared a very small house, indeed, um, with uh, an English bloke. Um, and he prayed every morning. And I sort of thought, this is... And he, you know, it, that was the essential bit of his day. There's, there's a perception, this might be more, 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 more Catholic than C of E, but a perception that religion involves sacrifice and giving things up, but you're describing it as something enriching and something that you almost envied when you saw the effect that it had had upon these two people in particular. Or, it, or, 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 or desired, if not envied. It's, yeah, it wasn't envied. It was, I saw a richness there yes. of a totally different kind. Of course, it does involve giving some things up. Mm. It involves sacrifice um, to some degree. But what you, but the presence of God, the knowledge of God, knowledge that you're loved by God through Jesus is infinitely more powerful and richer than anything one has to forego. And, and I'd, I'd never heard it put like that before, which is extraordinary when you consider the sort of schooling that I've had and the and the and the, and the life that I'd led. But I guess that's why he's ended up Archbishop of Canterbury, isn't it? It's not it's not by accident. It's like becoming manager of the England football team. You're probably going to be quite good uh, 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 at what you do. So I, listen, we've only got about half an hour on this, so don't hold back. Get get, get your call in early. Very simple question: um, How has it improved your life? In in like ways that other people would understand, sort of in in ways that you reflected upon then when you heard the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, just simply describing that that sense of love, that sense of being loved. How how, how has that helped you? How has that worked for you? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. And don't forget, it's mystery hour at twelve, so we will go from the divine to the ridiculous. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 22 minutes after 11. I, 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 Dave, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, listen, I'm not here to sort of administer to your spiritual needs or anything like that, but I completely get where you're coming from when you write, if God, God loves us so much, he gives our kids cancer, it's all absolute rollocks. You can have six billion believers, but it doesn't make it real, just as billions of, of kids believe in stuff that isn't real either. I'm surprised a man as smart as you believes this cod's wallet. I'm not, I don't, Dave. Most days, I don't believe it. Most years, I don't believe it. But I do believe that when I'm in church or when I'm praying or when I'm talking to someone like Justin Welby, it's doing me good. And we talk, if you need a, a, any encouragement, or I sense you, 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 it may already be a lost cause, but if we talk a lot about how you can carry on believing in God after terrible things happen. And you mentioned kids getting cancer. Um, Justin Welby and his wife lost, lost a baby girl in a car crash. And, and we touch on that as well. He also, during that period and type of time that he spent in Kenya, he, he, and I might need a slight trigger warning here, but he, one of the students he was teaching took their own life and it, and it fell to the archbishop to, to, to cut him down from a tree. So he, he, when he talks about Jesus and God, he's not forgetting, Dave, that, um, that terrible, terrible things happen. In fact, he would argue that his faith helps him make sense of them in a way that you and I perhaps can't. 23 minutes after 11. Um, so just a quick chat about the good stuff, because we spend so much time and will continue to talking about the bad stuff. James, what would you like to say? James in Glasgow, what's on your mind? Hi, good, good morning, James. Lovely to speak to you again, Paul. Um, I'm a, I'm a practising Catholic, James. Um, I've had I'm at mass kind of constantly as much as I can, and just when you were talk, you were speaking earlier on about guys like Jacob Rees Mogg, who absolutely sickened me. That, um, well, that's the, not very Christian of either of us, is it? We should really, we should really no, be re agree. <laughs> Go on. Uh, yeah. People who claim to be Christian do, do not carry out any of the values. Absolute. To use a Glasgow word, scun on me. I'm a man. I'm a man of faith. Uh, my family goes to mass. Um, I, I, I love faith, all faith. I mean, I, I was telling you the search. It's not a great phone um, line, James. So just if I, if I, no, let me nudge you towards wh how would your life be different without it? It's, it's all I've got to kind of hold on to, James. Like, Gosh. 
I mean, we've uh, we had bad grief in the family just two, a year and a half ago. My wife's younger sister died of sepsis, and she died in my arms. So my oh. wife's went the opposite went way. She's went away from the church. Oh, how interesting! Whereas it's all oh, I've got to like, hold on to, if that makes sense. Of course, it I does. just. Like, because I, I, because I'm a, postman, I'm, a, I'm a postman, James. So I, I listen to you walking my do my delivery every day. So that's my way. Sorry, how the line's bad. So I've come into my van. Thank I you. listen to you every day. Uh, religiously, basically, I listen to you <laughs> while you're, de- while you're through, delivering the good news. <laughs> I do well. It gets, through, uh, it gets me through my day and the bad news. And and it lets me. Uh, times I'm not listening to you. I genuinely say hail marys to myself. It's it's like. It's what gets me through, and I understand people hate faith because. Um, well, they see all they see all the very very hands. bad. They yep. see all the very bad things that have been done in the in the in the name of faith. I've got to crack on, Jay. It's only because of the phone line. I, I'm grateful to you for getting into your van, but it's still suboptimal. But but um, I like that, and, and I, that, I mean, one thing that always intrigues me is the sense of embarrassment. And I've gone through phases in my life when I've really needed it. I've been a little bit embarrassed about it, or maybe a quite a lot embarrassed about it. Try, try. I, I mean, the, the the church guy doing the readings in church, that kind of thing. Uh, normally, I'd boast about that, I'd boast about everything. You, you know me. No, I, wouldn't, I can't kind of keep that one on the down low, and I'm not in that zone at the moment, so I don't. I can tell you about it without feeling a bit potentially silly. Uh, Angela is in Bexley. Angela, what would you like to say? Oh, hello there. Yeah. Hello. Um, I'd just like to say that, um, um, first up, I admit I'm a cradle Catholic. Yes. <laughs> so, um, but I think for me, it's really been, the, like, I went to this Catholic school in London and I, we had one word under our badge, it was Serviam. Yes. It just meant service. And the, the, the badge was a constellation, it was a little bear. So wherever I am, you know, I'm outside in the garden, I'm looking up and I see the little bear and I think, yeah, come on, Lord, you've got, you've got to serve. And um, many, many, many decisions have I made based on that one word and the joy and the people and the connections even like, that come into your life is phenomenal, really. I mean, I just had a, a child. I, used, I, used, I am a teacher. Okay. Um, I, I had a, a young girl of mine um, who I taught years ago and she messaged me this week on Facebook to say, here's my certificate. She's joined the police. And she'd had a certificate for saving a man's life. Gosh. You know, these young... You know, I used to work in a Catholic school. And um, so, gosh, service. Service, yeah. And, and, and the thing is, I'll get a couple of texts now. And, that, 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 well, I do lots of service and I do lots of things mm-hmm. that, that... And I'm not religious. And no one's saying that there is a... A call, no. you know, that, 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 that you can't have one without the other. Lots of wonderful, no. kind, charitable, brilliant people. Yeah. Are, I don't have a, a, any religious, any religion in their life at all. But, but you're just describing someone who thinks that their relationship with service has been in part informed by their religious instruction, by their religious uh, education. Yes. What I would say to that, though, is that we're human beings, not human doings. So yes. part of my life is not just service. There is a prayer life. There is silence. Yes. There is that time. And, and that actually really is where the gold comes, the inspiration comes. You know, those moments where you are standing in your garden and looking at the sky, having a sense of wonder, and you're looking at the little bear and you're thinking, come on now, you've got to serve. Um, oh. So I think they're joint. They're connected. There's a big connection for me, at least. I love that. And again, it, do, it doesn't necessarily demand religion, but for you, that's no. where that feeling comes from. And you recognise the value and the importance of that feeling. Do you want, do you want the good news? Not literally. I, that's in the Gospels. But do you want some good news, Angela? Go for it. Go for it. It's just been announced, I think, in the last 24 hours that you can now buy a Donald Trump branded Bible. <laughs> You have to laugh, don't you? Well, I, mean, I think you probably do. You think I'm joking, <laughs> but it's a, it's a, have a guess how much it is. A Donald Trump. Uh, oh, 20 twenty dollars. No, higher. Oh God, fifty. Nearly, bit higher. Uh, 60? Yay! We got a winner. Sixty dollars for a God bless the USA Bible, uh, endorsed by Donald Trump. Uh, I, 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 crikey, I, I, you know, the French don't get everything right, but separating church and state was probably a step in the right direction. Uh, Unami is in, I, I'll come to you first after the news because it's half past 11. Also, I, I must quickly tell you at the very beginning of the next section, either before or after we speak to Unami, uh, about our second contender for the political c- catastrophe of the week. It, it's an absolute doozy. If I tell you that it involves 
a member of parliament, a fish and chip shop, and Lee Anderson levels of ignorance of your own past, then you may, if you spend too much time on Twitter, as, as I do, you may be able to put the pieces of the jigsaw together to come up with the picture before I have actually described it to you. But, that, but then, with Henry Riley, after he brings us up to date on this fascinating Johnny Mercer story, we have a tale of, I, I, I think, the funniest thing that I can remember happening in politics in, in a very long time, and that includes Lee Anderson. Thomas Watts is here now. LBC. Yeah. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 26 minutes to 12. Um, I will talk to an army and then I will give you the second contender for this week's extraordinary competition to be the daftest politician in town. Oh, the daftest politician in town was the smartest giant in town, Julia Donaldson. It wasn't, was it? But did you know, guess how old the Gruffalo is this year? You familiar with the Gruffalo? I, I, I'm, I'm, Axel Scheffler's illustrations, Julia Donaldson's text, possibly the finest rhyming well, no, that's not have an argument about it, but a truly beautiful children's book. And um, I couldn't believe how old it was this year. I'll tell you shortly. Unami is in Luton. Unami, back to religion. What made you pick up the phone? Good morning, James. How Hello. are you? Very well indeed. What's on your mind? Good. I'm a first-time caller. I was just calling to speak about the practical elements of being a believer. Yes. You get number one, that springs to my mind, is community. So I've that's benefited true. from many a... Uh, bottles of drink and you know food items being handed to me by a elderly member of the church seeing me as a younger person who could be their grandson for example and they're furnishing me with food and drink and i go home with that but even if i haven't paid attention to the sermon i've benefited <laughs> what sort of church is this where you get given free food just for turning up no oh, james you you're in the wrong churches, I assume. You're missing out. <laughs> because this is outrageous. We just get a bit, of, a bit of, get, get, uh, Obviously, we get the body and blood of Christ in a Catholic church, but I mean, it's 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 nourishing in spiritual ways, Unami. But it does it doesn't really fill the hole. <laughs> I know, but we're, we're blessed to have a lot of um, Caribbean cooks, mm. so we benefit many times from some dinner after service. I I, I mean, I, I I appreciate your point, although I, I, I kind of. Don't know that that counts as. I mean, what would your life be like without free food? Is not really the next question that I want to ask you. What would your life be like without that fellowship? Because I can't, I was trying to remember where I was yesterday when someone was talking about how hard it is to meet people and how hard it yeah. is to to make friends. And actually, church is a wonderful, almost a literal example of of a place where you do come together, where you congregate. This is a good point. I actually met my wife in church. So food, wife. Yeah. I, this, is, this is a pretty good list, actually. I, I'm trying to think what exactly. else might be. I, I, unless they do the opposite of the collection and you come away richer than you went in, you'd have gone for the perfect hat trick. Talk to me about the inner <laughs> life, if you would, briefly. The, 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 what it brings oh, cool. you that you don't find anywhere else. So I believe that um, God can only be revealed. You have to first show an interest. Um, and you have to go on your own personal journey to find out what does God want from me as an individual. And when you begin on that journey, I think it's something so precious that no one can take it away from you because you've done your own study and you've formed a relationship with God. Did you hear that clip from the Archbishop a moment ago? I did, yeah. It was, it was, I'd never thought of it like that before, but you, you clearly had that idea that you could um, sort of have the... Uh, I, 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 knowledge all your life but until you encountered somebody who, who lived it which was a phrase I'd heard but not fully understood until you encountered someone who'd actually lived it it wouldn't make sense in quite the same way uh, I think smartest giant was Julia Donaldson actually so uh, covering a lot of ground today Unami thank you God bless take care um, have a listen to this and then I, I'll tell you what's wrong with it okay so this is an MP uh, I think in Uxbridge called Steve Tuckwell launching quite an odd campaign. Hi everyone, I'm here in Uxbridge Town Centre and I'm campaigning to bring a fish and chip shop here to the centre of Uxbridge and I need your support to help the campaign. Here's the thing, there isn't a fish and chip shop in the centre of Uxbridge, there is on the outskirts, there is in Cowley and there is on St Andrews but we need to bring one home here to Uxbridge Town Centre. It will support our high street, it will support business, it will help the local economy so please join my campaign the more people we get to support this, the more it will attract investment and it will attract business to the centre of Uxbridge. 
join the campaign for a fish and chip shop in the centre of Uxbridge. I, I mean, I, I'm all for politics coming to the people, but I, I watched that yesterday and I thought, what on earth is going on here? And then someone told me it's a it's a data harvesting exercise quite often when politicians do this sort of thing. They, they get you to sign up to something and it means they've got your email address for future reference. So I thought, oh, fair enough. Um, uh, but then it, it emerged that this character, Steve Tuckwell, he voted against an application for a fish and chip shop in Uxbridge Town Centre when he was a, a, a councillor in 2019. And I just thought that the... The lack, I just love that. It's like, so today we've got Jonathan Gullis going on Sky News to complain about Labour politicians not voting for the Rwanda bill and being reminded by, I nearly said rewinded, being reminded by Sophie Ridge that he didn't vote for it himself. Uh, I, I, well, is there something in the water? Oh, no, that was the first hour. Is that, I, literally, there is something very strange going on. So Gullis turns up on Sky News and needs to be reminded that he didn't vote for the bill that he's criticising other people for not voting for. This character launches a campaign to open a fish and chip shop in Oxbridge Town Centre, having forgotten, apparently, that he voted against an application to open a fish and chip shop in Oxbridge Town Centre just a couple of years ago. What could possibly be stupider than this, do you think, in the annals of British politics? Who could possibly have made an even bigger plum of themselves than Jonathan Gullis and Steve Tuckwell in the last 24 to 48 hours. Uh, you'll find out later when Henry Riley joins me in the studio. Back to the co conversation about religion, inspired in large part by this week's full disclosure with Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury. A conversation, I just so, so mad stuff as well. We did it in Lambeth Palace, where I've never been before. I've been past it, but I've never been in. And we did it in a crypt, in a, in a, in a sort of uh, downstairs chapel. And he, he pointed behind where I was sitting and said there used to be a door there. And it was the door through which Anne Boleyn was taken to the boat that would then transfer her to Traitor's Gate at the Tower of London, where, where, where she would be beheaded. So it went from Lambeth. I mean, just stuff like that has got nothing to do with religion. But, but it's, it, it was just, just such a... I don't want to say magical, but it was such an extraordinary... And I'm trying to say extraordinary less. It was such a special encounter for me, the whole thing, the whole conversation, the whole setting, everything about it was lovely. And, and I really hope you take the time to listen to it, even if you're finding this conversation about religion slightly hard to stomach, as, uh, as at least three of you are, judging from my inbox. 11.41 is the time. Um, Stuart's in Gateshead. Stuart, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Nice to talk to you. I'm a first-time caller. What would you... If you were opening a fish and chip shop in Oxbridge, what would you call it? Uh, expensive. That's yeah, very good. That'll do. You're right. You don't get much change out of 20 quid down here now, Stuart, for a cod and chips. A, it's, and a ten, it's, a ten, it's a tenner up north, mate. There, well, up north. That's a reason to move. Anyway, mm. but back to Jesus. Yes. Um, so <laughs> what do I get out of it? Um, yes. Well, uh, I suppose he was a fisher of men, so there's a link for you. <laughs> um, uh, the... the, the, the um, I think for me, uh, I'm a convert to Catholicism, but I'm, 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 I suffer from a lot of doubt, so I'm not one of these uh, full-on kind of people. I, no. I kind of look at it from a philosophical perspective, but I did end up in the Catholic Church. Um, but I also have a, a couple of foots. I've got a foot in Buddhism, which I also, I'm also very open to some of their teachings. And I talk to a, an Islamic mate every Friday, because mm. that's his holy day, and I have a chat. So cool. for me, it gives his... Um, Personally, it helps me get peace, uh, but more importantly, it helps me forgive. Ah, oh, uh, that and is that's helpful. So, so forgiveness is not just forgiving other people, it's also forgiving yourself. Yes. So the peace and forgiveness thing, and I think most of my, because I'm a convert, I've done a lot of reading on the periphery, and there's some excellent people out there who actually if you if you listen to them it sounds very similar to to buddhism it it sounds very similar to to islam um the, the, you know the core um the core um calling for to say well okay we're not the center of our own universe uh, which unfortunately if, if we if we had more of that we'd have a, a much more harmonious kind of kind of life and world but that's yes. so, you know I'm a bit of, I'm a bit of a dreamer but uh, the you're not the is, only one uh, <laughs> ah, super tramp. <laughs> it's not yeah, super tramp, is it? Got you there, mate. Yeah, got you there. So anyway, yeah, ego, e ego is another thing that it doesn't, you know, dying in the world Catholics, I have some interesting discussions because they haven't sort of moved, a lot of them haven't moved on from being yes. a kid. 
Yes. So they haven't they haven't looked at peripheral stuff. So from a philosophical kind of thing, if you can get peace and you can forgive people, it's got to be a good thing. I, how can and there be that, how can there be a negative for that for you? How can that be a negative? Right. Mm. So the other thing is from the Buddhist kind of view. Uh, it, you know, I'll, I'm a big fan of Eckhart Tolle. I don't know if you've heard of Eckhart Tolle. He wrote The Power of Now. Mm. And I've he's heard from of the Buddhist yes, tradition. Yes. I would recommend that book as well as, 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 as a Bible or any other, Christ, or you know, a Torah, or any religious text, because there's, there's, gold, there's gold dust everywhere. And, and the, the ego is the problem. It's our, our own self-made manifestation of who we think we are. And that causes immeasurable problems and causes a lack of peace and a lack of forgiveness. So there you go. That's me. I love that. And also, something occurred to me listening to you, which hadn't occurred to me before in, in, in this conversation today, which is that the the modern craze for self-help and guidance and these podcasts that are teaching people different ways of... I mean, there is... a Humanity has an appetite for guidance. And Absolutely. the way you've yeah. described your relationship with religions, plural, sounds incredibly mm. healthy. But, of course, some very unhealthy things yeah, can, step into, think, can step into that but, space and, 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 and push people in directions that won't agree, ultimately but, be helpful. But the, po- but the differential, James, is the people that get all the airplay are mm. not religious. Mm. They're using religion to control people. Well, I mean, I don't be ridiculous. Donald Trump is selling Bibles for sixty dollars a pop. That's obviously that's obviously an act so, of of, of, you know, of you know, purity. If you, really, if, you really, if you really go to the root cause of the biggest problem we've got at the minute, you know, if you believe that you shouldn't kill anybody, then everybody's wrong, aren't they? I, I mean, that is impossible. I mean, Saint Augustine was wrestling with that long long before we were. Um, a glint in anybody's eye. Stuart, thank you, mate. That was beautifully put. And I think that's what I wanted today, the, the, the way that Justin Welby just does it in such a calm and matter-of-fact way with no prescription and no I'm better than you, even as a tiny, tiny subtext or, or no real self-benefit from it in terms of you're going to forgive me for this because I do that. Just talk about it. This is how it makes my life better. This is how it makes my life better. We could have been talking about yoga or meditation or therapy on a different day. But for, for, for Stuart and for many other people, um, it's, it's religion. It's 11.46. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10 to 12 is the time. Mystery Hour on the way at 12 o'clock, which, of course, for some people is a religious experience. But before that, I, I, there's a story that I have been looking at all week. Trying to not not so much yes, trying to get my head around because I, I find Johnny Mercer a fascinating politician, not necessarily for reasons that he would find flattering, but but I I, I don't mean in a bad way. He's quite chaotic. He, he doesn't seem to have a great ability. I'd, I'd rather have politicians like Johnny Mercer than politicians who never say anything because they're constantly censoring themselves and guarding themselves and they're being incredibly cautious. That doesn't mean I'd want him to be prime minister. I'd quite like cautiousness or caution to be in a prime minister's pocket. But for, for, for you know, junior ministers, backbenchers, people contributing generally to the gaiety of the nation, I quite like a little bit of unguardedness or, or chaos, as you could call it. And Johnny Mercer certainly fits into that category. But this week he is in the news for reasons that are both nuanced and fascinating. He has insisted to, and or, or rather revealed, to the inquiry into the war in Afghanistan between 2001 and 2021 that he has been told by a serving member of the Special Boat Service that... Well, I'll let Henry Riley take up the tale. Essentially, that, that war crimes were commonplace among serving British military personnel. Yes, yeah, so that's one of two issues. So j- just to give you the background of this, James, as you say, this uh, was established in December 2022, the independent inquiry relating to Afghanistan by the MOD, Ministry of Defence. And it's really focusing on three years of that conflict between 2010 and 2013, specifically the deployment of British special forces. And really, it's trying to look at whether there were any extrajudicial killings by the SAS, the SBS, that's the Special Air Service, the Special Boat Service, and whether in some cases there was a thorough enough investigation into how those deaths came about. But as you say, in recent days, 
it's been dominated the coverage by Johnny Mercer. Now, the first thing that he did is he claimed he was told that there was some truth in the allegations of war crimes by special forces. He says that he was told categorically that in some cases that may be true, but he has refused to provide that evidence, crucially the names of the people who told him that, to the inquiry. Now, Johnny Mercer himself, of course, a former British Army captain, he actually served himself in Afghanistan, he's now been served with a Section 21 notice by the chair of the inquiry. That essentially means that you can demand evidence from a witness. And I've been speaking with Lord Savile. He's the judge that chaired the long-running Bloody Sunday inquiry, mm. concluded in 2010. And he told me that the minister should hand over the evidence. If the question to be answered is likely to provide relevant information for the purposes of the inquiry, then um, it's it's the right thing to do. I can understand people being reluctant to um, give their sources, uh, especially if they've promised not to. The short answer is you, you want to be provided with everything that is relevant to your inquiry. I mean, that's common sense. Good example of it, the present case, because the uh, tribunal chairman has um, been told that there are these... Um, uh, other contact. Now, in the past few days, there has been support for Mr Mercer. It's important to say he's not sort of out on a limb here. Lord mm. Dannett, the former head of the army, um, has expressed support for him about the right to protect whistleblowers within the army. It is also worth pointing out, by the way, Lord Savile did himself briefly serve in the British army. Now, Johnny Mercer, as you were alluding to right at the start, James, crucially claims that a serving member of the SBS told him that he was asked to carry a drop weapon. Now, a drop weapon is a non-NATO weapon that's carried by special forces. It essentially means you plant it on a dead body, um, someone killed during a mission, to suggest that they posed a threat. Now, the chairman of the inquiry, Sir Charles Haddon Cave, has said that he needs evidence as to who told Johnny Mercer that and has said that it constitutes a criminal offence punishable with imprisonment and or a fine if you fail to comply. Now, Lord Savile, who I referenced earlier, he was also a UK Supreme Court justice and he told me that prison was a very real possibility. That is the sanction which is open to a public inquiry if a witness fails to provide answers with no valid excuse. That's all that the um, person running the inquiry can do if the witness won't provide a uh, proper answers to questions. Now, lastly, James, this will s sort of come to a head next week, really, because Johnny Mercer's been given until the 3rd of April, which is Wednesday, to write to the inquiry if he believes it is unreasonable to hand over those names. We have approached Mr Mercer for a comment. So far, we don't actually... It looks like he still hasn't handed over those names to the inquiry, but crucially, the chair has told him, you need to decide which side you are really on, Mr Mercer. It's an extraordinary story. I, I mean, I, I don't... I, he could face jail, technically, although I believe a fine is also in the in the gift of the inquiry. Yeah, and potentially both. But Gosh. certainly, certainly, jail is a. I mean, if the judge and the chair of the inquiry deems it suitable enough to go to prison, then it is a very real possibility, and it would be an, an extraordinary situation with a serving government minister potentially going to jail. And I, I suspect, James, there are conversations going on as to how they can um, have a sort of amicable solution to this. Because yes. yeah, at the, at the moment, it's quite I, I, tricky. I, I, I don't know about you, but when I was a, a, a young well, you still are a young journalist, but when I was a young journalist, it was a conversation you often had in the pub about whether or not you'd go to jail to protect a source. But mm. it hardly ever, 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 ever comes to pass. Mercer, not a journalist, of course, but the principle is similar. I think the principle is similar. And look, he does have skin in the game here because of his association with the army, particularly in Afghanistan. And I think there is a, a sense that he he may have been told these things and not told to share them, if that makes sense. Yes, and of he's, course he's it being, does. He's being brutally honest in sharing them. But of course, by doing so and making such clear allegations regarding drop weapons, also regarding um, allegations of war crimes, the judge in this um, respect is also quite right to, to demand the evidence. So it's, it's a strange situation where both have a degree of merit. Uh, Henry Riley, thank you very much indeed. We've been chronicling today a remarkable 24 hours for political incompetence. Mm. Uh, we've had a look at the case of Jonathan Gullis, who appeared on Sky News to complain about Labour politicians not voting for the Rwanda bill and was reminded by Sophie Ridge 
of that parish that he himself had failed to vote for the Rwanda bill when given an opportunity. We've heard from Steve Tuckwell, who has recorded mm. himself calling for a campaign to launch a fish and chip shop in Oxbridge Town Centre and apparently forgot that he himself voted against an application for a fish and chip shop in Oxbridge Town Centre. But I believe you may have a winner, albeit with someone who's not technically a proper politician. Yes, well, this is the actor and well, singer, I should say, as well, Lawrence Fox. Yes, don't forget that. Singer, um, who is the leader of the Reclaim Party. And as you referenced, James, we've been speaking about Mr Fox for um, a few months now, some time. Um, a development in the Mayor of London race. All the candidates will be announced at some point today. Someone we know who is not on the list is going to be Lawrence Fox. Now, you may ask why. If you ask Lawrence Fox, he says he's being cancelled and that Sadiq Khan oh. is trying to prevent him from being on the ballot paper, which oh, oh. is quite a serious allegation well, in and of be. itself it would be from a serious person well, well london elects which is sort of the, the body that deals with elections say that that is not the case um rather the reclaim party met with london elects for the first time on tuesday which was less than 24 hours before the close of the nominations deadline and he then did submit his paperwork in time but um upon inspection the body has said that they, it contains multiple errors which were too late for mr fox's team to correct <laughs> so he did get his nomination papers in on time but they were so um, error filled that the strewn is the word strewn, I believe. Error strewn, strewn. Sorry, come on you. Henry this um, is tabloid that, E's 101 yes, sorry um, they were unable to accept it and so we are in a position where um, Lawrence Fox will not be on the ballot as things stand uh, well I, and, and, and he's made a big song and dance about announcing that he's not going to be on the ballot yes and That's he had a excellent. big announcement that I was... might call a press conference to announce that I'm not going to be entering Mr Universe this year do you think that would be <laughs> similarly newsworthy I, I i've got a big announcement coming i am not applying to be the next pope henry i think i think it's tricky for lawrence fox this because he did trail heavily trail this big announcement which was going to be that he was running for mayor of london did, did he really i was joking yes no it was it was trailed that he did have a sort of big announcement which oh was, bless his little nike trainers and, which of course he wore at an event where he was encouraging people to boycott nike yes i did see a picture of that on twitter <laughs> But um, yeah, he's right. ignore the music. Okay, I sorry. always do. <laughs> he's a, we're, essentially we're in a position where he did make that big announcement, but that it's been derailed by the fact his his papers aren't in on time. Oh dear! Thank you very much indeed, Henry Riley. Uh, there is one person in the public eye, uh, a sort of journalist, who did betray a source and and ended up seeing the source go to jail. Any idea who that might be? Not off the top of my head. Isabel Oakshot oh, is her yes. name. She is the current partner of Richard Tice. Oh, yes. And Vicky Price was her source for a story about her ex-husband Chris Hume's speed, speeding ticket. And um, her and the then editor of the Sunday Times, John Witherow, handed her over to the police. And uh, as a consequence, she got eight months in jail. There's always a precedent if you know where to look. It's 12 noon. James O'Brien on LBC. Oh, four minutes after 12. And uh, the final hour of the week that we will spend together. I, I, I will be um, off tomorrow and indeed on Monday, but back with you on Tuesday. So make the most of it. Fill your boots, as it were. Um, Mystery Hour is a bit different from the rest of the uh, week. It's, it's, it's unique in many ways. And uh, I shall tell you why. Uh, it's not really b b b linked to the news in any way, shape or form. It's, it's largely apolitical. You do most of the work. I just sort of sit here, put my feet up and uh, and enjoy the ride. It's It's... Eminently simple, uh, in that someone rings in with a question, then someone else rings in with an answer. Latterly, of course, there's been a prize, the favourite contribution of the week, my favourite contribution of the week, and management's decision is final, um, wins a Mystery Hour board game, which is uh, a wonderful new addition to the panoply, to the universe of board game-based fun. And you can find the full terms and conditions for that competition at lbc.co.uk. Phone lines are open, and because we weren't on the phones in the last hour, but in the last quarter of the last hour, it was just Henry and I, um, it means you've got a better chance of, well, until about now, when everyone will go, oh God, it's mystery, I forgot, and then the phone lines will explode. But if you're really, really quick, you might be able to snuck in. The bar is high, remember, although Jake is in the chair today and he is not a veteran of Mystery Hour, so you might be able to smuggle through some old nonsense because uh, he's, he's not that experienced and Keith isn't paying attention, uh, in which case I'll get very, very cross with them, not with you, in a slightly performative and unconvincing fashion. But the point, uh, 25 years old for the Gruffalo. Sorry, Stephen. There we go. That, let's not turn that into a mystery. 25 years old for the Gruffalo. It's a cracker, isn't it? It's, an absolute, it's probably not my favourite. What's your favourite, Julia Donaldson, actually? Axel Scheffler collaboration I, I'd, I'd probably go for um, very fond of squash and a squeeze but what's, it, what's the one with the whale is it the whale and the snail the whale and the snail the whale, that's very good as well 
But I digress. Um, you can find out more about the ball game at mysteryhour.co.uk. In fact, you can buy it there, which is really the main point of me mentioning it. So you ring in, you ask a question, someone else rings in, they answer it. If you are supremely qualified to provide your answer, if, in other words, someone asks a question about toasters and you or possibly your grandfather actually invented the toaster, then you will receive the highest accolade. Oh, stick man. Yeah, good one, Marchie. You will receive the highest accolade available on the radio anywhere in the world. And we've had this checked. And it's true. It's the highest accolade available anywhere in the world. Some radio stations give away money. Some of them are in this building. But nobody. Money doesn't buy you happiness. And as the Beatles famously observed, it can't buy you love. What can buy you both happiness and love is a Ray Liotta. Uh, the, the, the award that we reserve for the most supremely qualified contributors to Mystery Hour. And you're only going to hear about half a dozen of them a year. But when you do, the earth moves. Shall we crack on? Shall we get going? Uh, Lee's in Carlisle. Lee, question or answer? Hi, James. Question. Carry on. I remember about a month ago you mentioned floor polish brought back really strong nostalgic memories, certain smell of floor polish. Yeah, not very nice ones. Well, either way... I was way, just queuing it, up it, outside my headmaster's study waiting to get beaten. Thanks for bringing that up, Lee. Sorry, apologies. That's all, that's all right, mate. But either way, it, it got me thinking, why don't we recall smells from dreams? It's always auditory or mainly visual. Rarely, if ever, is it a, a, a smell. Are you sure? And it's such, and it's such a strong scent. Yes, it is. Like it, bring, it brings back such memories, doesn't it? A perfume or cut grass or cut of bread. Does it? Are you sure it doesn't? I think you're right. Can you can you recall? I can't I'm trying now. I'm trying now. Something. Just give me yeah. a minute. Give Usually, me a, like an, an alarm getting into the dream or give me a moment. Really Just let me take visually. a sec. Let me take a second to myself. No, hang on. Sorry. No, I'm, I've got nothing. I'm not, I think you're right. I'm trying to think. I've yeah. not had a... Ge- I tell you, I, I, I've started riding into work, Lee. I've started coming in on one of those... Um, have you got them in I'm not, car- I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Sigmund Freud, James, by no, the way. No, I know you're not. It's not my dreams. But I, I, well, we go. there's a brewery near me. I go past the Fuller's Brewery in Chiswick on my bicycle. Do you have them in Carlisle? The ele- little electric bikes, that, that, that electric-aided bicycles that you can... We're, we're, we're still drinking milk from the tea up here, mate. We're not... <laughs> Let's go down the mines, mate. And I got the smell of the hops from the brewery, and and that's precisely the sort of thing that you might expect to pop up in your dreams. And I, yeah, I've exactly, got, exactly. I've yeah. got nothing, and the biscuits from the and the sugar well, beet I, factory I, I, in Kidderminster when I was growing up. I mean, these are redolent nostalgic memories. So you'd yeah, absolutely well, expect to have them coming from your dreams. I, I lived next door to a bakery most of, most Ooh, of my life nice. until I was about nineteen. Lovely literally stuff. right next door, and um, yes, some of the mornings just cracking the bedroom window open and getting there. Well, the there we go. I like, yeah. So why why does why do why do we not have smells in our dreams? I'm pretty mm. sure we don't. And if, if, if it might just be you and me, but it seems unlikely. I think we're probably quite a representative sample. Smells in dreams. Just uh, having um, quite rightly castigated me for my southern-based biases. It, 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 uh, d- you do have the electric bikes in Carla. No, no. You don't? No, 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 I haven't been in the town centre for a while. But no, I, I'm just I, checking, because I, I, I mean, so I think when you live in a big city, you think everybody's got everything, but sometimes you, you can't even get an Uber in some parts of the country. So I just, so I just mentioned it here, you can, you know, scan a QR code, hop on a bike, and then and then um, it's electric aided and, and ride it wherever you want. Uh, they're not that good value in the great scheme of things, unless you're buying passes and doing... Hey, why am I talking about? Let's just crack on with mystery. Sorry, Lee. John's in Dundee. John, question or answer? Question, James. Carry on. What do you call a female priest? Now, what title? What I mean is, what title do you give a female priest? A male priest is a father. Yeah. What title is a female priest? Reverend. Is that okay? I don't know. I, I'm just thinking out loud. I don't know. Well, it's not going to be mother, is it? I wouldn't have thought. No, I, I, that, that was sort of the, the flippant answer I was going to give myself. But no, this but wouldn't be no. flippant, because you have a reverend mother in a convent. A yeah. mother, mother Teresa was a mother, but I don't... I, and, and one noun would be priestess, wouldn't it? But you don't address a priest as Priest John. No. So you so address him as Father John. John. Or, Father, or Father James or Father... So it's what We could be here call... a while if you're going to go through all the names, yeah, John. Yeah, no, I'm not going to. <laughs> so it's what would you then call... Uh, the female. I, I, well, I'm 99% sure it's Reverend, but I can't. Um, 
Yeah. I can't take a round of applause for that actually because I can't because I can't prove it to you. I don't know. You think? Well, I I can prove it to you. I've got some on my Twitter. Fee. I'm followed by Reverend female Reverends, and they call themselves oh. Reverend. Oh well, well not uh, sorry. I'll do. Happy now. Thank you. Yeah. That lovely you. stuff. Round, no, round of applause for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Some people complain when I answer questions, but if you think about it, I can't win the ball game. So there might be a plus side to it. Uh, Rajdev is in Twickenham. Rajdev, question or answer? It's a question, James. Carry on. Um, uh, arachnophobia is commonly regarded as the most common phobia. and, and is many it? People Where do you get that from? Where do you, where do you well, get your figures from? Name your sources. Well, I, I, they haven't got them to hand, unfortunately. You're going to have to take my word on that. Yeah. But um, uh, most, a lot of people have a effectively a, uh, a neurological uh, trigger in the brain that you know that they bodily sees up if they see a spider. So it's it's, it's a known sort of a condition, if you like. Um, my one question is: Why is it spiders that human beings are largely afraid of, and not other very very dangerous animals uh, and organisms that you know we experience, possibly more much more dangerous than a spider? Well, I, I mean, the most obvious answer which you've kind of alluded to is poison isn't it they're poison it's a it's an evolutionary response to to poison i think isn't it certainly but there are there are very well you're talking you're talking about venom rather than poison I assume, yeah that's all oh, crikey but, get rajdev well played i am talking about venom rather than poison you assume correctly rajdev well done but there are many more uh venomous creatures on the planet than spiders um uh uh, I think I don't think spiders have that many uh, venomous breeds compared to the amount of spiders there are in the world. So that was really well, maybe my they were more mind. more prevalent then. Maybe just you're more likely to encounter a, a, a spider, and therefore exposure becomes your sort of uh, rationale well, here. What what, what would be your what would be your go to most venomous creature? Uh, well, I mean uh, snakes. Um, I mean, there people are aren't venomous. very fond of snakes either, are they? But no, that's, that's true. But it's it's not. And, I, you know, and I'm not sure reason. that. I, I mean, depending on where you were in the world, because I see some hilarious clips on uh, uh, online of people putting fake snakes in, and some people run a bloody mile when they think there's a snake near them. So there is a. a, a I mean, anything that can kill you is probably the answer. That there is some sort of evolutionary trigger for anything that can kill you simply by being in the same space as it. Surely. Well, well, that, that was. The- and like, um, bears, hippopotamuses, crocodiles, they all can kill you, but we don't have that same... Yeah, but not so, no, they can't really creep up on you, Rajdev. No, 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 I mean, yeah. Except, well, possibly if they're on tiptoes. If they, well, I'm, yeah. So why, why are we hardwired to fear spiders? I don't know what the answer is going to be, other than the fact that spiders are, are, are hardwired to kill us. But I, so, I mean, if we're going to put them in a hierarchy of why are spiders higher than others, then we'll put it... When I was rat-phobic, which I don't think is the technical term, I went through a period of being really rat phobic and then we actually had rats in, 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 in a house we lived in ages ago and uh, and I got cured. Not cured cured, but I no longer live in... If, I, if a rat runs across the towpath when I'm walking up the canal, I, I, I don't jump into Mrs. O'Brien's arms anymore like I used to do. Misophobia. Misophobia. Esophobia. Misophobia. Say it again. Musophobia. Why can't you just write it on the screen? Musophobia. Um... I, I, I was walking up the road and some a, a, a big fat leaf got blown across the doorway of Robert Dias and I actually screamed out loud. It was incredibly embarrassing. So so that is like a... a and a rat, of course, carries poison. You don't need me to tell you that. Bubonic plague. And that must be something inside, like a sense memory, an evolutionary memory, is thinking rat, poison, death... And then just the leaf, just in the corner of your eye, that kind of movement was enough to trigger me. Maybe spiders fit into that kind of category as well. I'll tell you what, you don't get this content anywhere else, do you? Not even with David Attenborough. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 12.18, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Mystery Hour is underway. Uh, some quibbling over priests and, and priestesses. Um... I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think you you call a priest uh, a, 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 a vicar in the, but you you have priests outside the Catholic Church. It's a it's a descriptive term, as much as it is a title. So so a, a female priest in the Anglican community is just known as reverend rather than father. So I don't I don't think you're picking up 
on a fair criticism there. But if I'm wrong and you're right, I'll, I'll correct the record um, immediately. But I, I, I'm pretty sure that, that Justin Welby would call himself a priest. When was Henry II? It was before the ref, so that doesn't count, does it? Anyway, on we go. Phillips in Maidstone. Philip, question or answer? Uh, answer, James. Carry on, Philip. Uh, it's about the priest. Oh, flipping it. Honestly, I thought... Carry on. Um, my wife is a priest. Um, technically not a vicar, because she doesn't have a church yet. OK. So that you become a vicar when you get the church, I Oh, think. And I never knew that. You live and learn. You could be opening um, a right can of worms here, you know, because you're not 100% yeah. sure about that, are you? Right. I'm 99% sure on that. What I am sure on is reverend is a catch-all term. Yes, but depending on your tradition, a female priest can answer to father or mother or reverend. Have you ever met a father? A, a, what, a lady who will answer to father? Yeah. Yeah, my wife will. She, what? I mean, but does she call herself that? She says she's completely easy on whatever you would refer to. She would refer to herself as Reverend Anthea. Yeah, that's but, what I said. But um, if someone called but, her father, she's not... Well, all you're telling me, Phil... Is that if someone called her father Anthea, she's not going to ignore them? No, so she said. She said it, it, right, it, 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 the term. It depends on your tradition. Abba. She's not too fussed on the tradition, so she'll answer to any, any of them. I but, think. I think it comes from Abba. Uh, go on. No, it's not even a joke. I, I think isn't Abba father in 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 the in biblical language? Abba, Abba, Abbas, Abba. I don't know. I may have just made that up. I don't know. I don't know. But it may be a gender neutral yeah. term. Don't tell the Daily Mail. They'll be banning Christianity yeah. next. Banning priests. All right. Qualifications: married to a priest. It's not many fellas can married say that. Priest. There's not many fellas that can say that. Although more than there used to be, Philip. Absolutely. Round of applause. Good. good. Do you get a title? You Do you get a title? No, I just oh. get all the jobs. That's, not, that's outrageous. A round of applause for Philip, please. Oh, thank you very much. So you, your wife's a vicar, my wife's a saint. <laughs> Sorry. Zolka's in Hamburg. Zolka, question or answer? A question, please. <laughs> I was quite pleased with that, Zolka, but on we go. What have you got? <laughs> it's another smell-related question. Oh, yes. I was wondering, why do we have two nostrils? Ah, I you think. see, we have two eyes, so we can see in 3D. Yes. We have two ears, so we can locate where sound comes from. But yes. these two nostrils are so close together that... They, I think, they do you know what I think? I, th I think what you've done, I think that you have focused entirely upon one function of the nasal passages as opposed to the other one. Uh, you mean breathing? I do. But what good is then that we have two of them? Well, what is in your nostrils? Um, I don't want to say. Well, no, not bogies. The other things, the things that the bogies hang on to. What's in your nostrils? There's hair. Yes. And what yeah. purpose does the hair serve? Um, to, to filter the air. And if you had one massive nostril instead of two little ones, how effective would that filtering process become? Hmm. I like the way you just tested it. <laughs> <laughs> So that must be the re I mean that must be the reason, no? Uh, I don't know. I, re I really I, I was always wondering because everything that is twice has a specific function on the body. No, again, you've done it again. You've gone you've gone you've gone down the wrong road. <laughs> okay. You don't not, need two nipples. I'm not fully convinced. Oh, oh maybe I have two kids. <laughs> oh, that's, <laughs> yeah, but they could take it in turns. <laughs> So it's well, just more efficient. Quite an unexpected turn. Now, nipples are quite a good example because nipples are, are... It's more efficient to have two nipples and it's more efficient mm. to have two nostrils, but it doesn't actually... I mean, you know, materially change their function in the way that it does with eyes doubling up and ears doubling up. Uh, and ears and knees and nose. Head, <laughs> shoulders, knees and toes. Knees and toes. <laughs> <laughs> Also, what if one's blocked, the other one works, you see, quite often. Whereas if 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 your if your massive mono nostril got blocked, you'd 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 be in, in a lot more trouble. I'll put it on the board, but I'm I'm more pleased than you oh, are with my answer, Zolka. Yes, I'm not 
fully, f- fully convinced. I sense that. Uh, halfway. I sense that. Do you know, an opportunity we missed. Uh, Abba is indeed the Hebrew word for father, uh, the Aramaic, I think, word for, oh. for father. So with you and your splendid name, from Abba to Zolka, we literally, in the space of one phone, two phone calls, we went from A to Z. <laughs> Look at that. That doesn't happen very often on the programme. So okay, have a lovely weekend. 24 minutes after 12. Head, shoulders, knees and toes. Knees and toes. Head, shoulders. So these are all doubles, you see. And eyes and ears and... Yeah. Oh, Assad's in Ealing. Assad. Well, heads, they've only got one head at the moment, uh, depending on the state of the British waterways, but that was covered in the first hour. Question or answer, Assad in Ealing? Uh, I have a question, James. Carry please, on, carry on. Okay, my, so my question is about fruit. I really enjoy eating fruit. Um, I was in a pub the other day, I said, in Wimbledon. Yeah. And I, 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 I had a gig in the, in the theatre, the new Wimbledon theatre, where I was incredibly well looked after. So thank you to everybody involved in the Wimbledon Literary Festival. But I, that's a very loud uh, indicator you've got there. <laughs> I beg your pardon. That's, that's all right. Else. You can't control it. It's not your fault. You can hardly put it. It's not got a volume control. So I was in the, I was in a pub. It was in the bottom of the travel lot, like you know, one of those pubs in the bottom of a hotel. And yeah. I had, I had a mineral water, a fizzy mineral water, because I, I had an event, and I don't like to have a, a proper drink before an event. And guess what happened after I, 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 I ordered my fizzy water, and she brought it, and she said, "Would you like ice?" And I said, "No." And at the end of that exchange. She said, would you like some fruit? Ooh. Has that ever happened to you in a pub? No, it never happened. Would you like some fruit? And I had to double check. I said, would I like I said, pardon? She said, would you like some fruit? And I said, fruit? And she goes, yes, fruit. I said, no. I'm trying to give it up. But why? I've never had that before in my life. I don't know whether it was a particular promotion that was going on in that particular chain or that particular branch or whether she was just a gardener and she'd brought in some of her own fruit so anyway i like fruit as well although I, you reminded me that i had turned it down the last time i was offered some by someone i'd never met before what do you want to know about fruit assad okay so what's your favorite fruit james that's not a mystery hour question no no but that will help me to oh i to see pineapple so, pineapple okay so sometimes you have a pineapple and it tastes really nice yeah. and juicy and yeah. the flavor is just really good yeah Sometimes, i had one this morning well not a whole one that'd be weird but i had a little tub of it yeah but then on other occasions you may eat a pineapple and even though it's ripe and in season it won't have that same taste pineapples and, are quite a bad example for your theory aren't they why well I, they, I, i've never had a bad pineapple Oh, you do get sour, do not. Sour, soury pineapple. Yeah, so I quite do. like that, though. I you quite, I quite okay. like a sour pineapple. I think so, what you want really to make things work is a pear. Okay, let's go with a pear. Or a melon. Okay. A melon. Right, melon, pear, strawberry. Melon. It's strawberry. Strawberry's the best, actually, because they yeah. can be of equal softness. And go. some of them just go there, and others just don't. Strawberry, go on. Okay, so regardless of the taste, whether you find it sour or just juicy or sweet, yes. will it have the same nutritional value? Blimey. So I, if I eat, because I, I, I eat fruit every day in the evening. Yes. And even if the fruit doesn't taste very good, I will eat it because I'm thinking that it's doing me good. It has, it has a lot of... Well, it's got the fibre amount in it is going to be the same, isn't it? Well, that, how, well that, that's one part of the nutritional value of the fruit, right? How about, does it have this, will a bad tasting strawberry have the same nutritional value, minerals, vitamins, fibre... As a really well, nice give or take it will. Give or take it will. But well, you... I mean, I, I, unless you can qualify that with your qualifications, you know, I, I would like to have an answer from someone with the with the required knowledge for me to have that confidence. Okay. What do you think? I think I might have made a bit of a fool of myself with the fruit question. I said. Why? Well, some people are suggesting that she might have been offering me a slice of something to go in my drink. <laughs> Okay. I possibly couldn't comment about those. But no one's things. ever said that to me before. Has anyone no one's ever said, Would you like some fruit? Would you like a slice of lemon? Or would you like No, you don't do that. You don't particularly in the UK. You never said you want some fruit. And also no. I'd already got my drink. I was I uh, Oh, of course that's what she wasn't if I was just oh yes please, I'd love an apple. What would she have done? Or a pineapple, yeah. actually, to you, yeah. uh, or a handful of blueberries. Do you yeah, think that's what she meant? She meant well, lemon in, in or lime in your water in my water? Perhaps, perhaps. You don't care. You just want to know about the nutritional value, don't you? I want someone to find out with the answer. Yeah, okay. Well, let's give them a Thanks. chance. I'll, I'll stop. Thanks, I, 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 oh, dear. So, would you like some fruit? Yes, please. I have a banana. And she just stuck a banana in my, in my, in my mineral water. <laughs> Chris is in Manchester. Chris, question or answer? 
So it's a question, please, James. Carry on. Uh, on, on behalf of my son, Harry, who's next to me, he's been oh. trying to get me to call him for years. Hello, so Harry. He's half term now. Lovely James stuff. James says hello. Hi. Hi, he says. Hello. Um, so he wants to know, why are uh, roses synonymous with Valentine's Day? Like, why is it roses that are typically given? I like that. I, I mean, mm. I, I think it's a bit chicken and egg. I think roses have been linked with love forever. Well, not, not forever. Pretty much, and then and then Valentine. I think it's, yeah. I don't know. I know. I don't know. And I'm, because it's Harry. If it was you, I'd probably try and make something up and pass it off as the truth. But seeing as he Harry, wasn't looking convinced. I'm not, well, he I'm, wasn't not, looking I, I'm convinced. not going to get anything past Harry, am I? Let's not be. Let's not. Let's not mess about here. He knows. He knows what's what. He knows nonsense when he hears it. Um, I bet he knew exactly what that barmaid meant when she offered me some fruit. Uh, there's no no doubt at all in his mind. He wouldn't have... Okay, why why are roses and romance linked? Because if we know why roses and romance are linked, we know why uh, yeah. roses and Valentine's Day are linked as well. Chris and Harry, you're on the list. All right, how old Thank is Harry? You. He's 10. Top man. That's uh, tw- Half past 12 is the time. Tim Humphrey has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.33 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC where the uh, mystery act continues. Why Why do we not smell in dreams? Uh, why? What's the evolutionary explanation for the ar- arachnophobia being, we, we believe, the most common phobia of them all? Why do we have two nostrils? I thought I'd done that satisfactorily, but uh, Zolka was gloriously unimpressed, or, albeit politely. Um, fruit. Does the nutritional value of fruit change much according to how delicious it is? That was basically the question. So it's going to be something to do with sugar fibre ratios. I'd be surprised if we get an answer to that. And why are roses associated with romance? All of those. Uh, Remember that my favourite contribution of the week wins a mystery hour board game. Although Chris has already played the 10-year-old sun card. You see, these bit, you think I don't know what you're playing at, Chris. I, I, I know it wasn't Harry's idea. He'd be far too honourable for that kind of shenanigans. But you thought your likelihood, your chances of winning the mystery hour board game would increase a bit if, if, if old Harry was in the car alongside you when you rang in for... And you may well be right, because I am a sucker. Penny is in Norwich, lovely part of the world. Uh, Penny, question or answer? Uh, answer, James. Carry on, Penny. Um, thanks and hello. hello. And I don't have a son, but I've got a fat cat called Pig who is enthusiastically listening. Okay, that's um, on the list. The, the spiders. <laughs> I did my um, thesis at college on why um, we have arachnophobia. Oh yeah. So I'm sh- I'm sure there's a PhD out there that can top this because it mm. was a college thesis. That's but right. it is a learned behaviour. Is it? It is. Yeah. And actually, it's not the most common. The most common phobia is heights. Yeah. Fair enough. We're scared of spiders because the way they move, we don't like them because they move hydraulically. And they move fast. They move fast. Also, if you, the survey I did, I, sh- I equalised the size of spiders and showed them to people and asked them which ones they were most scared of. And the most venomous ones actually come lower. It's the big, black, hairy ones that people don't like. <sighs> So there and, of course, they are venomous. But we get bitten by snakes a lot more a year, 300,000 snake bites a year, far more dangerous. Worldwide? Um, not not in Norwich? No, not in Norwich. No. We've only got adders in Norwich, <laughs> and I've never actually seen one. No. Um, yeah. So, so that's it, go. then. So, so they're, 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 they're weird and, and, and spidey, and that's why we don't like them. Yeah, I mean, they're eight-legged. They are venomous. Also, well, they can but, appear you know, anywhere, can't they? What, with their webs and everything? They can just sort of dangle down in front of you while you mind your... Is there one in here at the moment? They could have come uh, from... Yeah. So that, that kind Whoa! That kind of thing is going to train you to be scared next time something moves into your... Exactly. They move division. very fast. They don't like us. If, if people are scared of them and um, you're really bothered about them, then Lemon Pledge is a very good... Sorry, brand name. Um, but it's a very good off-putter of spiders. Is it really? That's what they used in arachnophobia to herd the spiders because oh, they were real learn. spiders. You live and learn. Yeah. Uh, qualifications did a thesis on it in college. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. So Rajdev's premise was wrong, really. Well, well, wrong about it being the most common No, but wrong phobia. about it being evolutionary as well, although it may have been me that said that. Maybe it wasn't him. But, well, um, I mean, there, there is an evolutionary aspect to every fear, but most of it's actually inherited from the reactions of the people around us as we grow up because they're so scared of spiders. That's probably certain. If your mum was terrified of spiders, you probably are too. Absolutely. Whereas your dad had to go and get them out of the bath and, and throw them out of the window. Or just yes. squish them while pretending to throw them. Oh, out don't squish them. No, I, wouldn't do, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I just Some yeah, people they're, might they're squish them while pretending to throw them out the window. So, they're, you know, they might do that. Uh, round of applause for Penny, please, Keith. 
Well played, Penny. 12.37, Alex is in Burnham, in Buckinghamshire, uh, not the other ones. Uh, question or answer? It's a question, James. Carry on. Um, why do we say quid? You know, when we're talking about pounds, when we're yeah. saying we're buying something, oh, I only cost a couple of quid. Why yeah. do we say quid? Where did that come from? It, I, 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 I it's think a good question, it, isn't it? It's all, no, it's all right. It's all right. But I, I, I think it's a bit, I think it's just another word for co- I think if you go back 400 years or mm. more, it's just a word for a coin, a type of coin would be a quid. And for some reason, it's stuck. Oh, okay. What's Especially that, what's, as a pound, for most of our lot. How old are you? I'm uh, 26. Oh, well, so you never knew this, but it used to not even be a coin, a quid. A quid used to be a, a, a paper. It used to be a note when I was your age. Not when I was yeah, your Yeah, I've got age. one at home. Have you got one? Oh, God, make me feel. Someone yeah. used to send me pound notes. It was a lovely lay. I can't remember why, but she used to send me... I think she sent me pound notes so I'd pay more attention to whatever else was in the envelope. But it didn't really work. I just used to take the pound note out. And say, um, thank <laughs> Quid, quid. Yeah, I think... Well, someone else will know, but I think it will just be the word for a coin back in the day so it became the plural would become 10 quid but it is a good question and it's a word we use all of us almost probably use every single day without ever thinking about where it comes from so yeah, we like I that yeah I thought about it the other day and just thought yeah quid I'll ask James 12.38 oh, is the much. time no good work uh, why do we call a pound a quid uh, why do we associate roses with romance how much effect well, is there any relationship between flavour and nutritional value of fruit why do we have two nostrils We've done the spiders, we've done the priest, and why, why don't we smell in our dreams? Uh, Carl is in Prescott. Carl, question or answer? It's a question, please, James. Carry on. Uh, right, I collect watches. Um, got a few mechanical ones, but most of them are battery-powered. Okay. When I put them in storage, I don't wear them. Yeah. If I pull the crown out, does the battery last longer? What's the crown? The bit you spin around to set the time. Ah. Whoa. That's a bit niche. <laughs> I'm sick of buying batteries. I mean, no, but you're the water. You're the watch collector. Why are you asking me? You should know this. This is you're the kind of person who should ring in to answer this question, not ring in to ask it. I'm not that technically into them. Just like the look of them. So, do the crowns always yeah. come out? Yeah. Is that because ah, cause mine fell out the other day. I took it to the bloke in Piccadilly Circus <laughs> and he put a new one in. And he's done a really nice job actually. Um, why would it? Why would the battery stop working? Can't you tell? Oh, because you haven't got... Well, can't you just tell? Can't you do a little test? It'd only take five minutes. I can't test the power of the battery if I just pull it out. Can I? It takes ages. Yeah, but if you pull it out and then it stops and then five minutes later you go back and the time hasn't changed and the battery's not being used. Have I misunderstood the question? It's like that. Possibly, I don't know. <laughs> it's like the woman in the pub asking me about fruit. Well, so so, so yeah. why would you not just pull the arm out and then if it doesn't stop, then the battery's still working? I'm not too sure if something's going on behind the scenes that I don't know. Well, well nor am but, I now. But if the battery is working, the, the hands will move, right? Yeah. And if the battery is not working, the hands will not move. Yeah, but I'm not sure if when you pull the crown out... Does that deactivate something in the battery so the energy of the battery doesn't drain? So, the so the hands out. might not be moving, but the battery yes. might still be draining, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Lord above, this is an odd question, Carl. Can't you ask one of your fellow watch collectors? I'm not that big. <laughs> I don't like to have some mad catalogue. I just buy quite a few watches. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find, I mean, who's going to know the answer to this? God, well, actually, quite a lot of people probably were. It, it, it breeds enthusiasm. Do you do it for financial reasons? No, I just like collecting. I mean, it's mainly Swatch watches that I've got and a few other different mechanical watches. But oh, okay. So, you know, I've I got like quite that. a few of them. So you're not doing it because they appreciate in value. They're a very good thing, aren't they? For for like, if you're a massive international criminal, watches are quite a good currency to elude to evade <laughs> the authorities and to and to money launder and stuff like that. I used to love swatches. I used to have loads of swatches at one point. I had a see through swatch. They've, what's the what's the rarest? Lovely, they've, they've got a lovely range out at the moment, and they've done a mashup with Amiga. Really? Um, yeah, and there's like a set of twelve, and they are, I really like them. Um, but I've got about five of them, <laughs> and every time I put them away, I think, is the battery going to be there when I come back, or do I leave it? Why don't you or, just take the you know? battery out, Carl? Because on them watches, I've got like a special battery cover, and I don't want to chip it or anything like that. So You've got an answer for everything, haven't you? 
<laughs> Sorry. No, it's not. I love it. I, 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 think, I think I've been all clever at every single thing I think of. You've, you've obviously been there first because it's there your watches. All right, you're on the list. If you pull the crown out, does it stop the batteries from being used? Uh, does it save the batteries, in other words? Um, now, I mentioned at the beginning of Mr. Hour this week that Jake was in the chair and that he hadn't done it before. There are two questions that I usually use as eggs. And I also said that Keith wouldn't be paying attention. Uh, there are two questions that I have always used in the past as things that you do never, ever ring in with on Mystery Hour. One of them is, why don't you ever see white dog poo? And the other one is, Mia and Victoria, question or answer? Question, please. Carry on. Why do you never, ever see baby pigeons? There you it is. There, yeah, you, you do. See, no, yes, pigeons. Yes. Not I know. other birds, yes. just pigeons. I know. Well, you don't see baby robins, do you? Mm, you might. You don't. Given the amount of pigeons you see around, you you've don't never see baby ever, crows. Ever seen... You don't see baby crows, and you don't see baby seagulls. Is that because their nests are very high up, and they don't want them to come down? Yep, or, or not even that high up. They just they stay in the nest until they can fly, and as soon as they can fly, they look like grown ups. Mm, I'm not sure that's the correct answer. Well, it's the only one you're going to get. Mm, says you. That, well, yes, says me. <laughs> And my word is law. Well, I'm not sure about that. Okay, what's your theory? I don't have a theory. That's why I'm asking. Well, you're very condescending need, about I my need, theory, considering I you have a... no theory. Well, of course that's the answer. You do. See, you, I mean, you see adolescent pigeons and you see young pigeons, but you can't tell because we're not experts in ageing pigeons. But the reason why you never see a, a pigeon that can't fly is because it's in the nest. If you wanted to see a baby pigeon, you just have to find a pigeon's nest full of pigeons that can't yet fly. An unfledged Has pigeon. Has anyone ever seen a pigeon's nest? Yes. Next question. When did you see a pigeon's nest? 17th of April, 2017. Mmm, Stuart's Inquiry. Uh, no Stuart's Inquiry at all. <laughs> I got a round of applause for me. Thank you, Mia. <laughs> and, and there it is. Uh, oh, three, four, five, six, I said, Jake, did you hear that little exchange or were you busy pretending to be on the phone? The two questions that we never, ever, 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 ever have on Mystery Hour. 12.45 is the time. Uh, you don't see dead ones either. We actually did this once. You don't see dead ones either because they'll get picked up very, very quickly by foxes and other predators. But you do. And my inbox, and I've said it on the radio again, so it's going to happen again. For about a week afterwards, every time someone saw a bed, dead pigeon, they sent me a picture of it. I don't want to see your pictures of dead pigeons. A, I'm not weird. And B, when you've seen one dead pigeon, you've seen them all. It's 12.45. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 49 is the time. Some breaking news for you. They have run out of the cheese-flavoured hot cross buns in Wimbledon's Morrison's. Um, they're probably dropping them in drinks. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Uh, thank you, Joe, for that. I, I don't know why we didn't put Yvonne's story in the news, the, the fact that they are actually delicious, although the Daily Telegraph managed to find some um, self-professed Christian to complain about them. Because that's what Jesus would want. If Jesus was with us today, he'd be looking at some of the situations in the world and he'd be thinking to himself, I hope that a Christian organization takes some time out of their busy schedule to complain about Morrison's selling cheese-flavoured hot... No, it's hot cross bun-flavoured cheese, not cheese-flavoured hot cross buns. Don't be disgusting. It's hot cross bun-flavoured cheese, which Morrison's currently has for sale, but not, I stress, in Wimbledon. Although I have to tell you that that came in at 12.33. So the situation may have been rectified in the last 17 minutes. Um, it's practically the travel news, this, but with hot cross bun flavoured cheese instead. Zoe's in Fife. Question or answer, Zoe? It's a question, James. Carry on, Zoe. OK. Um, why is it that when you're looking at, say, an island, um, you know, across water... Is it in it the stream? Look- an island in the stream? And yeah, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it can look closer or further away on different days. The same island. Um, the same island. Yeah, I, I grew up opposite the Isle of May in Fife, yes. and um, it was a view out my bedroom window. And depending on the day, it would look um, it just it would just look closer or further away. That's interesting. And the same the same when I remember having a holiday in Venice, and from Murano, Venice looked closer or further away. Mm. You know, from one day to another. I mean, would it not just be 
the clarity, you know, like the humidity or the or the. It, it could be the humidity, but I've got a strong feeling it's more complicated than that. Have you um, really? What, like the curvature like, of the Earth or something like it, that? It could be. It could it's be, unlikely. but I'd really like it's to know. Quite near. Why? Do, well, I'm, what if it's just you? It's definitely not me. How do you know? Because I've always lived on the coast, and um, at the moment I live in Tayport, which is just across the ro- the the Tay from Dundee and and Broughty Ferry, and it. It looks different on different days, it's, and people comment on it. People say okay. on the coast. Looks further oh, away, isn't it? Okay, yeah. I like that. That's a great question. I hope we've got time to get you an answer. So thank islands, you, thank you. islands. So a little bit of me there thought we might be going down. Do you remember when they were trying to explain to Father Dougal in Father Ted why the cows look further away and nearer? Did you ever see that episode? You I did not see no. that particular episode. Just no. as well, actually, to be honest, because it's <laughs> quite an insulting thing to be reminded of by your question. But as it turned out, your question wasn't anything like that at all and was perfectly valid. Um, and hopefully we will get an answer. Uh, so I will actually accept pictures of baby birds. Uh, those are gorgeous little robins. So you do see them. In fact, you do see baby pigeons, but you don't know that they're baby pigeons because you don't know enough about pigeons to know that that pigeon is actually a ba- technically a baby. If it can fly... It, it, yeah, <sighs> guys, Jake, you're in so much trouble for putting that question through. Seriously, you know, I, I don't know what you're laughing about, Keith. You're, you're supposed to be the gatekeeper. Keith is another Keith. This is I'm, I'm being haunted. This one's in Streatham Hill. Keith, question or answer? Good afternoon, James. It's an answer for you. How old are you, Keith? Fifty-six. Yeah, fair enough. Carry on. No, we're just always on the lookout for very young <laughs> Keiths on the program. So yeah, 50, no, I'm not, not one of those. I'm afraid. The world's no. young. What's the youngest we ever found? We found a very young. Keith. Anyway, we quickly. Found one at thirteen, I think. I think we did time, find yeah. a thirteen-year-old yeah. Keith, didn't we? It's an amazing it's achievement. A Scottish connection. It's, I yes, think, I think you're right. Maybe. I think they're different. Yeah. They do things differently there. Uh, watches, <laughs> watches, watches, watches. Watches. Yes. The short answer to his question is, it depends on the watch. Oh, oh <laughs> spoil sport. But yes. I do know the particular watches that he's referring to. They're very nice. Yes. The great uh, collaboration that they've done. Yes. And that, by pulling the crown out, will not work. Oh. What, what happens is when you pull the crown out, it engages a lever, yes. which acts as a brake on one of the wheels. Right. So the battery is still supplying the power to the rotor and yes. the, through the stator, um, and it's still pumping the, the, the power through, um, and it's not going to affect the length of the time of the battery. So it's going to run down at the normal <laughs> speed? Y- yes, it, it would. Two to three years, you'd, you'd probably get a, a life out of the battery on that. Love it. There are a few watches that when you pull the crown out it cuts off the electrical supply to the cell. So that, um, that can happen, but it, it's very few. And definitely not, on, definitely not on the ones that... Um, definitely not on the ones he's collecting. That Carl was but asking, really, he that? should leave the battery in, let them run, because yeah. the oil inside is flowing round, rather than just getting them to seize up over years. He oh. should just let the batteries um, run, things, but make sure he changes it when it stops in the two to three years' time. Okay. Because after that, the cells can leak and destroy the insides of the watch. Qualifications? Horologist to the stars, 40 oh, years. That'll do nicely. <laughs> Horologist to the stars. Do you have a shop or, or do you do you only do home I don't home, know. I work for Swiss, com- Swiss companies and... Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. You're a hardcore horologist, aren't you? I can tell you. You're being <laughs> modest about your... No, you know what? I mean, you, I, you seriously are. I've asked are. a couple of your horology questions before. I know you um, have. I know from you. Bond Street, yeah. I, I know yeah. You. Well, but you were based in Bond Street. We're going back a while now. You used to email me a lot. We are. I did, yes. Well, I don't even <laughs> read my emails anymore because I get so many. That's not me being Billy Big Bananas. That's just, it's nah, impossible to keep track. Immensely. So, yeah, yeah. I've got to look at that. Round of applause for Keith. Great work. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Well, I had a question yeah. for you once, and I thought next time he rings in, or next time he emails me, I'll ask you, and I've completely forgotten what it was. <laughs> it's always a way. It is, isn't it? I'll remember the minute that the show ends today, or probably the minute I say thank you, Keith. Goodbye. Uh, Neil is in, ah, Neil Rankin in uh, Tower Hamlets. Neil Rankin, as you will know, is one of the country's leading chefs, which means that you are probably here to answer the... Fruity one. The fruit question. How are you, Neil? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Very well indeed. What have you got? Um, so, I suppose there's two answers to this. One, the ripeness of it um, mm. could make a difference, but, but very small difference because it'll be picked very closely together. Yes. Timeline. Um, so, I wouldn't think it would significantly be different because we've made in the same place, the same sort of soil, same weather. Yeah. 
Um, but taste difference generally means that it could be two things. One, a really high water content, which means that there is less nutrients. Yes. Or it's bad soil or bad sunlight or bad climate that they've been growing in, which would mean less nutrients all around. So it is a really good indicator of nutrients, oh. is flavour. Oh, okay. So yeah. yes and no, really, is your answer. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, right, if, it's, if it's right, but he said it wasn't to do with ripeness. So if, it's, if it feels, feels fully right and it doesn't taste as good, like if you, if you buy an expensive tomato, it will taste really good. If you buy very cheap tomato, yes. which is grown with a really high yield and lots of things within the same amount of soil, then it will have less nutrients Less flavor it's really that water. simple. So, so a, yeah, pl- yeah, a, a, a tasteless tomato is is it really just spread the same amount of nutrients if, far too thinly. Yeah, if you it's, it's actually that. interesting. If you, if you think about a really expensive tomato, usually has more nutrients in it than than a smaller one. So, uh, uh, like a value tomato. Yes, so of a lot of them are actually the same price per amount of tomatoiness. Ah, uh, oh, so it's a brilliant question then. Yeah, it's quite a good question. I like that a lot. Right, uh, qualifications? Uh, chef and really nerdy about fruit and vegetables recently on Instagram, so I did a lot of research. I love it. Round of applause for Neil, please. <laughs> Look at that. Um, I, I was just trying to think of something then. I, I tasted something the other day that was just obscenely delicious, and it, it was something. It, was, it wasn't a tomato, but it was something that you'd eat all the time, and you suddenly realise you can actually have. I'll tell you what it was. It was nothing to do with fruit or vegetables. I was at the Maids of Honor tea shop in Kew, and every single thing they serve in the Maids of Honor tea shop is like the perfection of that thing. Whether it's a cucumber sandwich or a scone or a chocolate eclair. Uh, you know, Sheila, when yeah. you eat a chocolate eclair, yeah. normally the sque- the cream yeah. all squeezes yeah. out the edge. You know, a proper chocolate eclair shouldn't do that. Doesn't happen, yeah. The Maids of Honor tea shop in Kew, there I don't it is. Know. I should go there. I live oh, quite near there. Oh, it's extraordinary. Oh, I'm on my way. The pie, the quiche, everything. You oh. know, with a quiche, the pastry would normally oh. be... Oh, anyway. <laughs> Joanna's in Bromley. Joanna, question or answer? It's an answer, Carry James. on, carry on. Um, and embarrassingly, I had, it's the answer to the dream question. Can oh, you yes. smell in your dream? Yes. Um, I had a dream just last week oh, yes. um, that <laughs> I was, the doctor refused to treat me because I had incredibly smelly feet. Oh. And I could smell how disgusting they were in my dream. And um, I hasten to add, my feet are not smelly. Well, I never. Uh, had, any, had, had you bought any hot cross bun flavoured cheese from Morrison's recently oh, 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 I, I can only think that would make things worse yes so can, but well, I'm wondering if there was anything smelly in your room at the time and the dream caught up with the sense because that happens sometimes my daughter thought it was an anxiety dream yeah so it certainly is I mean, it's an <laughs> right qualifications I smelt feet in my dreams that's the first yes that's okay. it. It's got you a round of applause, China. I don't know what you're going to do with it. I hope you feel better soon. Uh, who's my favourite? I think I'm going to give it to Keith, the horologist, partly out of loyalty reasons, because he, he he has been on board forever. And I used to love his emails. And because I don't really read emails anymore, it's nice to make contact with him. And he's helped me with many, many other things in the past. So in a way, it's a legacy award of the Mystery Ad Board game this week. Also, you know, keeping the Keith alive. That's it from me for another day. We'll be doing it all again uh, on Tuesday morning from 10. I am obviously, well, not obviously, but I'm telling you now that I'm taking Good Friday and Easter Monday off. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at 4 o'clock on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. James O'Brien on LBC. 